I got caught in a stretch. Ugh. That was an accident, but you I did? just went with it. You gonna be okay? Yeah, I can just not help. Sometimes it happens with dogs. They just go mm. to lay down. They're like, oh, wait, no, no, this is a stretch. Ugh, there we go. <laughs> just turns into stretches just sometimes happen, you know? Got to go with it. It can definitely happen. Yes, just go with the flow. All right. All right. Speaking, speaking of, let's do it. Speaking of, let's do it. Welcome, everybody, to episode number 56 of the Goulet Pen Cast, where fountain pens are still a thing. I am Brian Goulet. I'm Drew Brown. And we're here from Goulet Pens to deliver this casual and informal, tangential, and extraneous, superfluous, and extemporaneous fountain pen show, where we talk about what's going on at the Goulet Pen Company and in our fountain pen lives. In today's show, we're going to be doing a deep dive. You said we, we Brian. You said we. We. We, I, Drew will ask, I will dive. I will um, try Drew's to stay awake. Gonna, Drew's throwing me into the ocean <laughs> uh, with somebody who has 40 plus journals that they're writing for their family and they're asking about the archivability of the paper and ink to make it last as long as possible. And it kind of sent me down a rabbit hole. So I'm gonna share that with you all. Kind of. um, if we would ever travel internationally for a pen event, which of our first fountain pens that we're still using, our favorite Robert Oster inks, the differences between the Twisby 580 and the Twisby Eco. And we got a spotlight on the Kaweco All Sport. And we have a hypothetical question from me this time. And another classic mind blowing fun fact at the end, if you can make it there. It's gonna be a good one today. It's gonna be a long All one. right. Go ahead, queue up your lawnmowers and dishwashers and vacuums and whatever mindless activity that you like to do while you listen to this thing. We're gonna make it happen. And we're going to kick it off with feedback. All right. First things first, Brian. Important redaction today. Uh-oh. I need to print a retraction with my mouth mm. and say, I was wrong, way wrong, when I said, you know what, Brian? I think synthetic fabric is better for heat outside than uh, cotton. Way wrong. Way, way wrong. I was mm. corrected on numerous fronts now, why about is that. that. I don't I think, know. I think I, I agreed. I, I probably agreed without really listening to what you were saying. Right. No, cotton, cotton, cotton's good. Synthetic's terrible. I think synthetic's good for like keeping like the actual fabric dry. Yeah. But not just ter terrible for actually letting your skin breathe. So don't listen to me when it comes to doing things outside. Because you know what? I don't just, I'm just not an authority in that zone, Brian. So. Okay. I would say uh, not not all fabrics are created equal, so it probably no. it probably makes a difference. Like I wouldn't want to wear a, a wool sweater while I'm outside, you know, working in the woods if it was warm. Some, out. Some, someone said merino wool is actually really good for breathability. So that's mm. some next level wool right there. If you did want to venture, in. but summer. a ton a ton yeah. of people said linen is the way to go though. So I know you don't want buttons, <sighs> but. Maybe what? it wouldn't be so bad. Throw on like a. Can't do buttons. You Not might be able to do buttons. Not while I'm like physically working outside. Like you never know. I'm hard on my clothes. Y'all don't understand. All right. Well, you don't there understand. Was, uh, uh, there was even one recommendation of denim. Because that's that's a pretty pretty hearty choice. So. I mean, yeah, it's durable. Anyway. I just wanted to say I'm sorry for the cotton. That was just the wrongest wrong thing to say. We don't know what we're talking. We don't know what we're talking about. Y'all know. No, that. no, no, we don't. And then um, I got uh, two questions about a comment that I made when we were talking about stub nibs, Brian. Because I said that mm. uh, I change the way I write when I write with stub nibs. I, I write from under, then okay. from the side. And some people were like, "What is what is an under? What does underwriting mean?" Mm. And you know, I'm sorry. I didn't. I just assumed that you knew and you didn't. So I'm sorry about that. I should have clarified. So really quickly, if you're normally writing like this across the page and you kind of approach it from this angle, right, 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 right. Um, you can just write like this and go right, 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 right. And when you're doing that, you have the nib flat on the paper and you're kind of doing this motion instead of kind of like that motion. And if you've got a stub nib or sometimes a flex nib, keeping it flat on the page like that and just doing up and down strokes means you get fat downstroke, thin cross stroke. Or if you're using a flex, you get to actually put that pressure down and get wide strokes and thin strokes as well. So using an underwriting orientation when you have one of those specialty nibs can often get you that line variation a little bit more definitively 
since that's its intended effect. So that's just what I do. Mm -hmm. It's just a habit, and it uh, is pretty universally effective, I think. But uh, yeah, yeah, give it a shot if you want to. I think most of the terminology we've used for underwriting has to do with folks who write left-handed, where you might actually have like side side writing, like writing where you're in line with, you know, like your hand actually drags over your writing, or overwriting where your hand is actually above your writing. So yeah. under underwriting could literally be anything under that line. But I think in your context, you're talking about literally like I literally move my hand beneath the writing. Yeah. Or, or you can just turn the paper. Like some people just turn the paper and, you know, like for me, it's less comfortable to like turn my hand because we have to do that in videos sometimes, mm -hmm. depending on how we have the camera set up. And I find that if I move my hand too much, my writing just looks really strange and it feels awkward and I end up, my handwriting looks crazy. So I usually have to like hardcore turn the paper or literally move my entire body to keep my hand in the same kind of position to my body. Does that make sense? Oh, see, yeah, I find that way harder though. So I just like I would rather I would rather keep my hand exactly where it is and turn the paper because then I'm keeping all the same muscle memory. But anyway, it could be something. Play around with it, especially if you have a stub or something or a flex or whatever. Yeah, that sounds way more difficult because then changing. it's like I'm writing, then it would make me feel like I'm writing sideways. A little bit. It just depends on what, you know. Oh, try, no, that freaks me out, man. Try it both ways. I see on the opposite. It just depends what naturally feels better to you. So. Yeah, but it works it, with, with, with stub nibs and flex nibs. It definitely mm -hmm. helps things. And lots of space love. Brian asked uh, for some space is cool responses, and we definitely got them. Brian, you melted a few people's brains with your fun fact there at the end. It was, uh, <laughs> yeah, it was it was fun, but it was also kind of brain melting. So yeah, we might have lost some followers, like literally. So sorry about that. Well, it was the end of the video. So. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it was over. It was um, over. So, oh no, I mean like permanently lost, like their brain melted. It's not good. Oh gosh, that's not you, good. That's not the you goal. Don't come, no, you don't come back from brain melting. Come on, you know that. <sighs> okay, wow. You know that better than anyone. Yikes. After last Tuesday, yeah, you know. Sorry. Anyway, um, shout out to Megan, because Megan, in response to our pen spotlight, said not only is she a big fan of the dragon pen, lots of fans of the dragon pen, by the way, Brian, <laughs> lots of dragon fans out there for people not only was megan a fan but megan said that uh, she needed the purple dragon pen because the others weren't audacious enough for her and i was like wait what purple, what purple? dragon pen they apparently make a multitude of different colors it's like a lacquered version of the jinhao dragon pen where the raised portions of the dragon are still prominent and gold but then the relief is like a um not a lacquer uh no i guess it is a lacquer probably like a, no 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 not a lacquer what do they call um what's what's the the fill stuff that they put behind the old, the old visconti enamel that's it yes so it's like colored enamel uh in the relief so blue purple red green so i obviously i'm, I'm sending that to some people at the goulet pen company to see if we can get our hands on some of those because they look awesome um so thank you megan that was super sweet very cool that, that's it for me nice I got some feedback from Pete. Um, said deep dive into turkey hammock time. That's this little secret part, the most hardcore people. In case you're new, I don't know, you're not new at this point, but in case you are, that's those are the people that stick it through all the way to the end. Uh, turkey hammock time, I just wanna say thank you for another great pen cast that I really enjoyed watching. I love the depth that you go into, along with all the tangents that distract you. You might be regretting that later, Pete. We're going to test you on that, Pete, today. It's my belief that wanderings like this are a sign of an active mind. And oh, so God. And not something to be avoided. Thank you, Pete. I'm going to take that to heart and I put, I, I added this that comment. often. I found this comment before I knew you were going to deep dive today, Brian. <laughs> I, yes. might not have, I might not have put it in otherwise. Drew's got some regrets now. I'll be uh, like, come on, Drew, Pete. We got to do this for Pete. <laughs> I will keep that in mind. Uh, King Zarathus. Well, wow, didn't realize we had royalty in our midst here. Uh, I see, or sorry, I love how these and other videos help humanize Goulet pens and the employees. It's not faceless people filling orders. It's true, we all have faces. Um, I also really appreciate how much quality of life as a whole the Goulets try to maintain for their employees. Yes, we do. I will happily pay the extra few cents an order or wait an extra day or two for it to arrive knowing the company values are so wholesome and caring. That's true. We're not, you know, intentionally trying to charge a premium over everybody. We try to be pretty fair with our prices, but at the same time, we never try to be the cheapest because that will usually come at the sacrifice of quality of our team, quality of service, and um, we got standards. So we're always gonna do the best we can, provide us value is what we seek to do. Um, but it's always great to hear that kind of feedback that you really appreciate that. 
because uh, it's one of the benefits of doing videos like these. So we get to show the human side of, for better or for worse, show the human side of what we do. <laughs> <laughs> And then Paint in Hiding says, Hello, Brian and Drew. I'm V from Thailand. Hello. Uh, it's been about two years since I really got into fountain pens, and it's all because of watching Brian's videos from years ago, where he just sits and talks at his desk. They haven't changed that much, though. Um, lots of concise, vital in info. Concise. That is a word I don't often get called, so thank you. Uh, thank you for making content like this available for free worldwide. I heard on a previous podcast about why pens prices differ from country to country, and it's cheaper for me to buy pens locally. Not a shock. Uh, so I wanted to ask how international viewers like myself could support Goulet pens if we're not directly ordering from your website. Other than religiously watching and interacting with your YouTube videos, of course. Thank you again for all you do for the Fountain Pen community and newbies like me. Drew, love your energy always, especially when talking about Pilot Kakunos. Got to recognize Drew on that. Yeah, Drew does, does bring some energy, doesn't he? Um, no, really good question, actually. Um, so I'm always, I'm kind of amazed at this, honestly, because we live in, you know, I do this myself. I watch free content for all kinds of things and different areas of my life, learning how to do electrical work around my house or fix something on my car, you know, and I just consume the content that I know someone has put a lot of time and energy into doing, and I'm not paying anything for it for from them. And I totally recognize that that happens a lot. And it was understood from day one when I was putting out this content that that was going to be something that a lot of people did. But it was like, you know what, as long as we can get enough people <laughs> that will support us, buy from our store, we'll keep putting out the great, great content. And it's like the rising tide raises all chips. Just getting, did I say chips? Rising tide raises all ships. So just putting out good content, educational content about using fountain pens, it's going to be good for the whole industry, the whole hobby, anybody who wants to enjoy these products and enjoy writing, you're going to benefit from that. And as a whole, the community will drive value and then buy from people like us and other people who put out great content. So at the macro level, we're doing fine. And, you know, like you said, just engaging in our content, commenting, you know, doing those kinds of things that don't cost money, but that are just time, you know, and your own energy and effort and, you know, contributing to the community that that does have value. So I don't want you to feel like you have to give us, you know, financial money um, in order to to give back some value, um, just certainly engaging with that does make a big difference. Um, and you know, anybody else that you're buying from locally, even you're supporting the industry as a whole, the manufacturers, all that kind of stuff. So really kind of everybody wins in the end. Um, but you know, I've been thinking about this because we do have a very, very large international audience on YouTube, especially, um, believe it or not, about 60% of our views come from people who are not in the US, even though we are you know, very predominantly um, shipping our products to people in the U.S. just because economically that's what makes the most sense. Shipping costs and customs duties, all that kind of stuff is very expensive overseas, plus exchange rates, all that. I won't get into all the reasons why, but it makes sense. It's economically, it doesn't make as much sense for people to buy overseas from us. So a um, lot, lot of viewers, a lot of viewers that we have who are not able feasibly, feasibly to buy from us. So um, I have been thinking about this just, you know, for those who do, want to directly support us. We don't have anything in place right now. I'm still kind of thinking about it, but there are options now for that. You know, and it's interesting for us because, you know, a lot of other people who produce content, they might be enthusiasts and they just kind of do it in their free time. And while that is somewhat true, we're also essentially self-sponsored. So we're supported by Goulet Pens and the products we sell. So, um, you know, we don't, you know, we don't call, fall into the same category that most other enthusiast content producers might. Um, so there are things like Patreon and other, you know, uh, ways that people can essentially donate to the content creators that they like to follow in whatever category um, and can essentially kind of fund the creation of that content mm -hmm. directly, even if somebody's not selling merchandise or a product or sponsored or something like that. Um, so that is something we could do. We, we, we could monetize. We could run ads on our YouTube channel and YouTube may run its own ads. We don't have control over that, but um, we don't monetize our videos anymore. We tried it for a little bit and, you know, it was just, it's just a lot of ads and just a lot of disruption. And I was like, I just didn't, the, the money wasn't worth it and all that for the disruption that it caused to you all. So we chose not to do that ourselves. Um, but, you know, certainly we could 
start a Patreon or something if people wanted to donate directly just out of the goodness of their heart and you find value and you you know it's not economical to buy, um, you could do that. Or there's there's other things now even directly through YouTube um, that are options. So there's uh, like a YouTube membership feature where there's a couple you know additional like perks. There's like polls and emojis and you know little things, little banners and stuff like that that can help you stand out in the comments and we can engage with you more. Haven't looked deeply into that, but that is something that's you know, an option. Um, and there's also a YouTube, um, I forget what it's called, but it's sort of like a donate type feature. They have ones you can donate to like a fundraiser and it just kind of passes through and goes directly to the, to the fundraiser. But there's also a, um, I forget, I think it's called like a giving thanks or, or something like that, um, where you can just like basically give money to us. I don't think I've enabled that or whatever. I don't know if we, you know, how exactly that works, but it's a newer feature. Um, I haven't uh, looked deeply into it yet because I'm, you know, still kind of figuring out what that looks like. But, um, you know, I'm curious if, if y'all do, you know, if you're like active YouTubers and you follow anybody else who's enabled some of those things, I'm curious what your actual experience has been because our experience has been with things on YouTube. <laughs> Sometimes features get enabled and you're like, oh, this sounds like a great idea. And you're like, ah, eh, this doesn't actually execute quite like we would have hoped that it would. So we don't want us to be like the guinea pigs flipping on some new feature and then have you all, you know, have some bad experience as a result. So if you have experience as somebody who's like given to another content creator and that's of interest, or if you just have feedback about that in general, you know, basically we're doing, we're doing okay supporting ourselves through our store. Um, but you know, I'm open to that if that is something that, um, is interesting and I'm not going to lie, it would, you know, help us produce more content if we knew that it was very directly tied to the people that are watching us on YouTube. Um, so anyway, I'm thinking about it, but you know, we're still doing, still doing our thing. It's not going to stop us. Um, if we don't, you know, get some kind of funding directly to it, but thought it was an interesting thought. So there you go. All right. That's all we got for feedback. And uh, let's go talk about some new stuff. All right. I realized, Drew, that it's like completely dark outside. I look like I'm in a cave now. I have like one light. Normally it's brightly lit in this room, but we got like big storms that are coming overhead and it is almost pitch black outside. And it's what? 2.45 in the afternoon. Yeah. So it's a little crazy. Sorry about <laughs> if I look weird on video. That's because they have no external light that's helping me here. Um, anyway, uh, what's new? Coming soon stuff. So we have um, a 10th anniversary Platinum 3776 Century Pen. This is, uh, I think, the 10th anniversary of their Century. The 3776 is older than that. Um, but it's a Century limited edition. So black pen, gold trim, got some some ribbed action going on there. So um, kind of a classic styling. They've got some older pens that look like that. Not something you typically see today. Um, I believe that these nibs are slightly different. I'm told that they're slightly softer than their normal nibs. I have not they used are. I have not used them myself. Did you use one? Yeah, I, I, I did the fingernail test, you know, where okay, I, pressed, okay. I, 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 press, I just pressed it up against my thumbnail for, yeah. for a little bit. That's not saying a whole lot because the standard 3776 nib is probably the stiffest gold nib in the industry. Yeah. But so so it's easy to say yes it is softer for sure. Yeah. Um but it I don't expect it if you say soft gold nib this isn't that. This is a softer gold nib than the 3776. But would, it would is you call very, it more is it more like a gold nib like you would have on say a Pilot or something like that? Just a conventional It's it's, it's yeah, it's probably more similar to a conventional non bendy pilot nib yeah. would you call it springy maybe not soft no not springy. Wait, what, what do you mean sp spring i mean it's definitely not soft like i would not put it i would not say the word no because they I they mean, have they have a soft nib on some of their patents yeah which is i, I wouldn't expect also it not soft. soft i mean it's in softer <laughs> comparison yeah no i would say i would say if you if you just gave it to me and say this is a gold nib i'm like yep feels like a gold nib and that that yeah, that would be it for me all right, but I will. I, I think it. I think it, it. feels better than normal platinum nib. I think it looks better. I like the profile. It's less flared out on the shoulders. A little bit more pointy. Yeah, there you go. So uh, very cool. So I'm gonna try to learn more about this. But anyway, we'll have that on the site. It's a uh, uh, four hundred ninety-five dollars. So it's up. I feel like they should have. They, they could have. If it's a tenth anniversary for the century, I feel like they could have called it the century decade and confused some people. Oh, that would be good, wouldn't it? Missed opportunity. Hmm. That, that would be very confusing. A, but. Dec a, deca a decade of the century. <laughs> there you go. Um, another thing that we got, moving on uh, to something that is not a pen at all. Um, we have these adorable little Puni Labo cases. Now, to be fair, these are not new. These are new to us. There are some of the designs that are new were 
that cause us to relook at them. I mean, they're not the typical fountain pen type thing. You know, there might be other like pen retailers who sell more like pencils and roller balls and stuff that have already had these for a little while. This is not a fountain pen specific thing, but they're they're pretty darn adorable. And uh, from what I understand, they've been fairly popular in the US. Um, so these come out of Japan and uh, they're essentially just pen cases. Um, so you stick all your pens in the head, you sort of decapitate your little creature and you stick all your pens in. And then, you know, I found that with, even with, you know, thicker pens, like I had like a Sailor Rialo and I had, a, you know, Visconti Homo Sapiens and some, you know, fairly girthy pens, I could fit about eight, maybe nine pens, depending on which pens that you're working with. You can fit kind of a bunch in here. Um, now there's, they're not like individually protected and stuff like that. So I think the intention of these is they're more like a pencil case where it's just like everything's kind of bunched together. So be cognizant of that. Don't go through on your most precious pens that are gonna kind of clank into each other. Um, but certainly it's a very adorable way to transport <laughs> writing implements. And they um, come in corgis. They get, we got, so there's 10 different animals, corgi being one of them. I've got the Shiba. The only one. That, I mean, that's, you're a little biased on that one, Drew. Um, but they're also cool because they can, they can fit pretty long pens. I think like seven and a half inches or something, basically as long as almost anything, except maybe like a Lamy Joy or, a, you know, Pilot Parallel, something that's like super long desk pen style. Those get a little tight, um, but any pretty conventional pen will fit in here. Um, but then you can also push up the bottom so that if you want to stand it on your desk, the pens will sort of stick out the top, you know, so it'll stick out, you know, enough for you to be able to grab whatever pen you want, but then when you're transporting, you can have the bottom drop out. And uh, I mean, or you could just leave it up. You don't necessarily have to. So um, they're 20 bucks and uh, they feel awesome. They're silicone, so they feel really just smooth and squishy and stuff like that. So they're great like fidget type things too, um, if you really want to be doing that kind of thing. So they're adorable. Go check them out. Um, yeah, that's what I got. How about you, Drew? I love them. It's a Corgi. <laughs> All right, so as far as products I'm going to talk to you about today, we're going to be talking about the Visconti Watermark in Gilded Rose. So this is a new watermark, which if you already know, the watermark is a um, overlay pen. That's the word. So resin, double reservoir power filler, big, big, big pen with a metal overlay. And the overlay is comprised of a bazillion little Visconti V logos stacked on stacked on stacked on top of each other to create a cool little skeleton-y overlay effect. We've had them in blue and silver. We've had them in crazy rainbow. And this one is in gold overlay with a very, very, very dark, 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 dark red resin underneath. You can see that it's red if you hold it up to light or you can see it during some of, in some of the most thin aspects of the pen, but at first glance, it definitely does not look red. It looks kind of golden black. So it's a hint of red. It is a hint of red, but hence the gilded rose. So it is reddish thing that is gilded. Hooray. So they're super expensive. They're super crazy, but they're super interesting. So check them out. It's one of those pens where you will know immediately if it is for you or not. And then on top of that, we are getting in some Sailor Monyo series pens, not inks. The Monyo ink series has existed for quite some time, but now there is a whole series of Pro Gear Slim model pens dedicated to the Monyo aesthetic. Meaning, each of these pens, five I believe, are dedicated to two Monyo ink colors. So you've got a different color set of the finials on the back and the front, and then a body color, and then a different uh, grip color that also matches the finial. So they took two Monyo ink colors and said, all right, this pen is gonna represent these two inks. This other pen is gonna re represent these two inks. So it's kind of a, a, a collaboration, a unification of multiple inks all together. And these are sets, which means you get a pen and an ink. So Monyo pen set, pen and an ink. The pen is inspired by the colors of the ink. Of course, it's Sailor, so somehow they have taken these combinations and made them all look really good. And uh, I just can't get over that. I just, yeah, with Sailor, really good at that. Yeah. I, they just don't make terrible colors. I think I might've, since since we've started carrying the brand, there's probably been one color I've been like, eh, not my jam, but m most everything else, man, they just look good. They just look good. Yeah, that's the new a, stuff. They have a good eye for it. Like I look at some of these and I'm like, I would never think to match these colors up, but. But they do and it they works. They do, they make it work, they, they got a good eye. Yep, awesome. 
All right, moving on. If y'all are ready, whoo, it's Q&A time. All right. Oh man, it is a torrential downpour out here right now. It's kind of yeah. crazy. It's crazy, crazy, but I'll take it because we haven't had rain in a while. So this will be nice. Um, anyway, so if you can hear some background noise, maybe that's where it's coming you from. Did, you didn't have rain last weekend? Uh, over the weekend? Yeah. No, we had some rain yesterday, but I don't think we had any over the weekend. Oh, oh, you had some yesterday. No. Okay. No. So you're talking about like before yesterday, you haven't had one, haven't had. Oh yeah, it's been while. like a solid oh, okay. week. Yeah, everything's gotcha. all my gar grass is dying and everything, but. Yeah, my, our whole neighborhood, all the grass is brown. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. All right. All right, Brian, what did you do here? I, I did a thing. I have a lot of notes. All right. Do you do you want? Oh my God, two pages, dude. Yeah. I didn't, do you want? Oh. Do you want to come back to this one, or do you want to be disciplined? <laughs> um, let's just, let's just kick it off, man. Let's just make it happen. All right. This is what y'all are here for. This is for Pete. Pete, this one's for you. Uh, it's gonna Pete, be a big Pete, one. Let's Pete. just get into it. All right, everybody, don't point <coughs> to Pete. This isn't his fault. This is Brian's <laughs> fault. All right. You got to ask a question though, Drew. Yeah, well, do I? What if I don't ask the question? <laughs> then nothing then you're, you gonna hear, you're gonna hear me talk more. <laughs> I'm asking myself. Okay, okay. This is from Darlin. Darlin. Help, Brian and Drew. To preface, I keep two journals, one for my kids and one for my husband. I only use shimmer inks as of late, but use regular fountain pen ink in my early journals. As of this moment, I have about 40-ish Travelers and Goulet notebooks that I keep in a fireproof slash waterproof case. How can I make these last? a lifetime. Should I only use document ink? Will shimmer ink last? Is there a specific paper I should use? Is there a top coat I can use to seal in the ink without hurting the paper? Maybe vacuum seal them? Would love to hear your thoughts. Smiley, smiley, smiley with hands. All right. So this sent me on a journey. To be fair, there's several questions here. Um, very legit questions though. We do get asked about this quite a bit. And I think that uh, it's it's uh, very interesting to talk about. So uh, if you're not interested in this at all, please just click on to the next timestamp because we're going to be here a little bit. Where do um, I click? Yep. <laughs> Sorry, Drew. Can't do it real time. <laughs> if you if you need to go get a third coffee or something, now would be a good time. No, I'm good. I'm going to be engaged and yes. present. Okay. I'm going to try and make it interesting and engaging. Okay. Um, so when you're talking about storing something like archivability, right? Um, you got to think about it. Just there's some different things you got to consider maybe that a little bit. Um, so things like how the paper might feel or whatever, uh, that, that's kind of secondary because you're going for longevity. So your experience of writing it, I think should be the last of your concerns. I think it should be really what's going to last because that's why you're doing all this. Um, I think the most important thing to think about is actually how you're going to store it. So if you store them improperly, then basically nothing else will compensate for that. Um, and you seem to be doing pretty well with that actually, Darlin. Um, keeping things in a cool, dry place because heat and moisture are the enemy as is UV rays. So keeping things out of direct sunlight, um, you're in really good shape there for, for normal longevity needs. Um, though I will say that it uh, doesn't, you know, maybe leave them open to catastrophe. I mean, you mentioned that you have them in a fireproof, waterproof case. I think that's even a great step for, you know, the intentionality you have. And it's like, you've clearly spent a ton of time to write 40 some notebooks. Um, I think, you know, taking a little extra thought to wrap them up and store them away intentionally is, is, is wise. Um, but things like theft, fire, flood, zombie invasion, whatever it is that concerns you over you know, your lifetime, your kids' lifetimes, whatever, um, is pertinent to think about when you're talking about really, really long time. I think the fireproof, waterproof, safe thing is really amazing. I think that's really good. That helps with some of the catastrophe stuff um, and helps with sunlight, obviously. Um, doesn't necessarily help with moisture though. Um, so you do have to be conscious of that. I mean, we live in Virginia uh, right now. It's 100% moisture because it's raining. But even this morning, it was 91% humidity where we are. So if you just have a safe in your garage or your shed or whatever, it's going to be that humid inside that box. So you do want to be thoughtful about that. So try and keep it in a climate controlled environment if you can. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, if you can't control humidity, then um, getting some kind of like little dry pack or they make little things that you can put into, you know, boxes or safes or whatever that will absorb moisture that's inside those containers. Um, so you can look into some of those. They make, you know, electronic ones. They make other ones that 
Um, you know, I think like Damp Aid or something like that is a brand that they have for like bathrooms and that are really moist and basements and that kind of stuff. So there's, or Damp Rid, maybe it's called, I don't know. Um, but they make like essentially like, yeah, you know, like beads that can absorb moisture and you replace them every so often and that can help control humidity because the, the humidity in the air is, is what's going to kill your paper. Um, I think the uh, the vacuum sealing thing is really interesting because that actually solves for a couple of things. I would make it waterproof for one, um, you know, but then uh, would also help with the humidity control. Um, so I think that's actually very appealing. Obviously it makes it a little less accessible if it's something you're gonna be referencing often, but if you're going for long-term storage, I think the vacuum sealing thing is actually a really, really cool idea. So I would definitely encourage you. You can get like those vacuum seal bags that you just like use your vacuum. You don't need like a special system. I mean, you can use like food sealers and stuff like that. You know, those would be pretty notebook size for something like you'd have in your kitchen, but you can literally make the ones that you like hook your vacuum hose up to and it just sucks all the air out. I actually just got some of those for like some pillows and comforters and stuff like that, that it's, it's not winter time here. So I don't need to be, have those things at the ready. So I put like a comforter and four pillows and just like <laughs> sucked all the air out. Now I have like this like big potato chip of <laughs> comforters and stuff that we just slid under the bed and it's like, oh, we got so much more storage in our closet now. Um, so something like that for storing your notebooks would be pretty cool. Um, okay. And then, you know, obviously if you put that in a fireproof, waterproof safe, it would just give it like double protection, right? So um, now we're going, <laughs> that, that's not even the deep dive part. So, um, you know, one thing that I found helpful was uh, an article that maybe we can link to uh, that was from the Library of Congress that actually talked about um, long-term paper storage and what causes paper to degrade. Found that to be particularly helpful. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll try to link to that, but I'll summarize the high points here. Um, so as far as uh, your paper and ink choice, so you've so assuming you got your storage needs taken care of here. Um, what you want is, is pH neutrality. That really matters a whole lot for both paper and ink. Um, paper will usually say if it's pH free, or sorry, mm -hmm. pH neutral or acid free. Um, so if it doesn't say anything about that, you can assume maybe it's not. I wouldn't assume that it is if it doesn't actually say it. I know a lot of our fountain pen papers will say things like, pH neutral and acid free, but uh, don't necessarily assume that it is on all notebooks. Um, so, you know, here's a little bit on a little bit on paper, and this is where I went on a bit of a deep dive. So, like, why does it actually break down? So, paper is made from cellulosic materials, like either a cotton rag or wood pulp. Um, you know, like plant plant based material. Most paper. Um, uh, at least today. I'm not talking like papyrus and goat skin and like you know, practical things that you would buy in a notebook today are going to be uh, most likely made of wood pulp. So cotton rag, um, which is like the papers they used to use, you know, 100 years or plus longer ago, um, they have longer fibers and they'll last longer over time. So the longer the cellulosic fiber, the longer the paper will last, the softer the paper will be. You can still buy some cotton rag paper. We sell some um, stationary that's, that's cotton based. So that would have a little more longevity to it, but the, the format of that's not gonna necessarily be great for long-term storage and kind of thing. So um, we really don't sell a lot of notebooks that are made with cotton rag. It's pretty much wood pulp. But anyway, cotton rag is generally gonna be uh, a little more enduring, um, you know, uh, than your wood pulp, but you take what you can get. So wood pulp, slightly shorter fibers, won't last quite as long as cotton, but um, anyway, that's pretty much what you're gonna get with modern modern paper. Um, so wood pulp, it contains lignin. So lignin is the organic polymer that basically binds all the cell walls. So you think of it as like the binder for the actual wood. So it gives it its, gives it part of its structure um, and uh, gives it its strength. So I'm very oversimplifying it, mainly because I don't understand it, but it's a thing. Um, but uh, lignin, uh, becomes acidic over time. It starts out kind of acidic, but it becomes even more acidic over time. And acid is the enemy towards storing paper, um, especially the more it's exposed to oxygen and the more it's exposed to moisture. The paper that has lignin in it, it will just really, really accelerate things, the degradation. So it's the acids that make the paper uh, turn brittle, get really thin and crack over time or break or cause them to yellow and degrade. Um, like if you think of like old newspapers that have been like left in the attic or something like that, they kind of turn yellow and really, really crunchy, crispy and kind of just like disintegrate. Um, that's part of why. So, you know, there's a couple different ways that wood pulp can be processed. One of which is a mechanical process, which is what they use for newsprint. Um, it's a faster process, but it breaks down um, 
those fibers more, so you get shorter fibers, not as much integrity in the structure of the paper. Um, and it also does not remove the lignin, so you have more of that acidic lignin left in the paper. And so it's gonna yellow and it's gonna get more brittle and break down quicker over time with a mechanical pulping process. Um, and almost none of our manufacturers will say which process they're using, but um, I think in order to basically get pH neutral paper, uh, you can't really do that with a mechanical process as easily. Um, you're pretty much gonna go with a chemical wood pulping process. So the chemical is better for archivability because you are going to um, maintain a little bit more of the integrity of the pulp fibers. So you're gonna have slightly longer fibers, which is gonna make it stronger and it will remove the lignin out of it too. So you're gonna to help to get that uh, potential for increased acidity to be neutralized. And then of course, depending on how the paper is treated, you know, as part of that process and what sizing is used, you can have even more pH neutrality, neutrality or even go slightly, um, slightly basic on the pH scale if you want to um, kind of prevent future acidity. Um, so, um, you know, basically pH neutral paper is going to last longer. Uh, it's going to be a little more expensive to produce. So you're pretty much not going to find it unless it's advertised as such, uh, as I kind of mentioned. And most of our fountain pen papers are going to be pH neutral, especially the nicer stuff. Um, so I think it's, uh, that those are some of the most important things. So I would go like storage, quality of paper, and then ink is really kind of like the last factor um, because the ink is, well, it's basically the last step in the process too. So um, in terms of the ink, you mentioned a couple different types of ink that you're using, um, like shimmer inks and just conventional fountain pen inks. They do make document inks and permanent inks and stuff like that. But if you think about it, permanent ink doesn't matter at all. If your paper sucks and your storage is not good, the ink has nothing to stick to. The paper breaks down, then the ink is for naught. So I think take care of the other stuff first, and then the ink is really kind of of last concern. Um, if you have, you know, again, pH is the, the answer here. So anytime you can use a pH neutral ink or even something something maybe even slightly basic, um, that's good. Not most, most ink makers don't advertise their pH at all. Uh, some will advertise pH neutrality, so that's good. Um, and you would assume that most things that are advertised as document ink or something like that, archival ink, um, would be, you know, fall more into that camp where it's not going to be super acidic, but some inks are surprisingly acidic. Um, it really depends. And it literally depends on one ink color f to another. It's, it's like the dyes that are used and stuff like that. It can vary wildly. So yeah, even within the same brand, just the, oh, yeah. because you might, you might find one ink that's pH neutral in a brand that does not mean that every ink in that brand is the same way. They can vary Absolutely. wildly because Absolutely. they're all made of different stuff. Yeah, and unfortunately, we don't have a lot of that information on our site unless it's an ink that the manufacturer advertises as pH neutral. Um, but there are some blog posts and various things on forums and stuff where people have, you know, scientific folks have actually tested the pHs of several different inks. Um, I've not, not found any super exhaustive list, but the longest I found was like had maybe 100 or 150 different kind of inks. So that's something you can double check on. Um, you know, but again, it's if you're using really good paper, I think the ink, you got a little more leeway on the ink. Um, in terms of what you use. So be conscious of the pH of the ink. Um, I don't think you necessarily have to use permanent ink. Um, from what I was reading on the Library of Congress, basically is like just with the basic storage stuff, I'm not even talking about like vacuum sealing and all that kind of stuff, but just using, you know, pH neutral paper and storing it in a cool dry place out of sunlight, it says it's gonna last basically a lifetime, uh, potentially hundreds of years. So with proper storage, it's gonna last a really, really long time. You know, if it's something super important, then you take all those extra steps. But I think you're pretty safe just with those steps that we've already covered. And then you can use most any ink you want and you're gonna be just fine. I think if you're going to the nth degree, then go with a permanent ink, go with a pH neutral, something that's archival. Like we got several different ones, like Diatrament has several, a whole line of document inks that you could use. Um, you know, shimmer inks, I don't know that, the, I, I honestly don't know how the shimmer impacts anything. You know, from what I understand, most shimmer inks are more or less conventional ink with like a, a pigmented kind of shimmer additive to it, which I don't think, it's kind of a blanket statement, I don't think that that necessarily would sacrifice the integrity of archivability, but I don't know that it's really been tested for that. And, and shimmer inks haven't really been around long enough for that to have happened naturally. So it's a little bit of a question mark. So I don't have any reason to believe that shimmer inks are any worse for archivability than any other conventional fountain pen ink. 
I could be wrong about that, but I just didn't have any of that information on hand. So um, it's a bit of a question mark. I would say use your own judgment and maybe just kind of treat it like it's a conventional fountain pen ink. Um, if you want to go to that nth degree, go with a, like a Diatromentous document ink, maybe a pigmented ink from Platinum or Sailor. They've got a couple. Um, Noodlers has a line of permanent inks um, that are advertised as pH neutral, like black and uh, I believe Heart of Darkness and like things in that vein. Those would all be uh, more archival choices as well. Um, and then there's some other inks that I think are pH neutral, like maybe some private reserve ones. I can't remember. I know there's a point where somewhere, I'm not sure if it still are, but um, you know, if you can find that information, then, then that's a good way to go. Um, but I don't think you have to be super worried about what you've used so far. I think you know what's done is done. Just take care of it for the storage as good as you can. And then for your own sake, if you want your what you write with moving forward to last as long as possible, maybe consider going you know, with some more intentional ink choices around that longevity. And then another question you asked about was a top coating. So I know that that is something that is done more with artwork, like mixed media and acrylic paints and stuff like that. I found, I just did a quick Google search because I'm not aware of any top coating product for ink on paper necessarily. I think there's some that are, you know, like spray products that you can use um, for like decoupage and other type of, of art media. Um, I didn't find, you know, I basically found acrylic sealers, which would not be great for fountain pen uh, on paper. And I think that you would then take the risk if you, especially if you're using, you know, more or less of a conventional fountain pen ink, if you spray or rub some kind of sealant on top of it, you're going to have two potential issues. One would be you could actually lift the ink off the page and kind of like reconstitute that ink just as if you were to wipe it with something wet like a wet washcloth or something you could end up actually smearing it and destroying it just by putting that sealer on uh, so i would definitely do some tests if you wanted to go that route um, with a non-important document some tests using the same materials that you're using um, but i would also be concerned about the long-term effects of that and how it would react with the paper you know, I think most of these spray things, they're meant for other medias, whether it's canvas or something, you know, acrylic on canvas or whatever. I don't know that they're tested for paper. I don't know that it's good for that. So there could be some acidic, you know, component to those spray sealers that would actually destroy your paper when all you're trying to do is protect it. So I, I don't know of any specific product that is for, you know, a top coat application for making fountain pen ink on paper, you know, archivability. So I can't recommend anything. I think anything that you would be trying to do there would be more of a liability than it would be uh, protection. Uh, but I could be wrong. So please let me know if you know of anything, anybody in the comments. Um, and the last thing I would say is, you know, you've got all these things before you like wrap them up, seal them up and lock them away, mm -hmm. consider digitally archiving them as well. You know, obviously the hard copy physical archive, mm -hmm. I believe actually would be, you know, <laughs> depends, the, those are in the digital space. like. Formats change, mediums change, you know, you have to store it digitally and you can easily lose things out sight, out of mind. So it's not the end all be all answer, but it could be a good backup. Like just in case you have a crazy fire, like you can get a really good safe, but if you have a fire that just destroys everything, having them stored digitally on the cloud somewhere, not a bad idea to have as a backup. So I would consider maybe, I mean, it would be a project to do with 40, 40 notebooks, but you know, taking pictures of the journals that you've done so far, you would at least then not lose the writing that you've done, you would get to keep it in some other way. So it's a bit of a different thing than what the question was. But if I'm thinking like of that much writing, I'm like, ooh, I would probably want a digital backup of that just to kind of have on hand in, in case all else fails. So whew, that's what I got. What do you think, Drew? Did I keep, did I move it along okay? Did I keep it going? Yeah, we've done, you've done worse. <laughs> okay. It was only about 15 minutes. You've definitely done all 20s right. before. All right, I tried to, I tried so. to really be, this, Thorough, no, no, this, was, this, was, this was this was not bad, and I think that you hit some great points. And honestly, it was not uninteresting. Okay, I'll take it. Yeah, Drew Brown, stamp of approval. All right, I, I'll just assume you have nothing to add, and you can. Yeah, I can still, I can still okay. be, I can still be friends with Pete after this. <laughs> okay, uh, Sconest, uh, would you ever travel internationally for a pen or a pen experience, Drew? Um. Yeah, you sort, well. of, you sort of have <laughs> technically. Yeah, we, we have. We've gone to Italy. I, uh, Brian and I have gone to Italy before. Brian's gone a bunch of different places. I've just been to Italy. We went to see Aurora and Monte Grappa. Uh, that was very much a work thing. So I went as a representative sure. of the Goulet Pen Company. The very company pen paid related. for me. Yeah. So 
Yeah. Um, well, actually, I, the company didn't pay. Um, we went with Kenro, our distributors for Aurora and Monte Grappa. So that was very much a work trip. Like it was quick. I feel like it. What was it? Two days. It was quick. Of, yeah. It, like it was like two days. It, travel. We we flew overnight. Slept. Woke up off the plane and just started our day. Like it was fast paced. I think that we had one afternoon where we got to go to a car museum and that was that was pretty much the downtime we had. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, it was just, it was strictly business. So it's a little interesting because for me, my <clears throat> professional fountain pen life and my hobby fountain pen life started at the same time. So removing myself from that and saying like, would Drew Brown the pen nerd actually travel internationally is, is a little tougher. I would say the only time I would do that would be if I could visit Tokyo and do a bunch of stuff and go to the Tokyo International Pen Show. That I would do, hmm. even, on my, even on my own dime. Do like, non, I would, like a bunch of non-pen stuff with pen yeah, stuff? Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't hmm. go just for that singular event, but I would go having that event as like a, a tent pole event of that trip for sure. But I would is, like- What else is going on in Tokyo that you would want to do? Oh, dude, like there's like Mario stuff, there's Disney stuff, there's Pachinko everywhere. Like I would, yeah, I think that'd be a blast. I would love to go to Japan. There's so much interesting stuff to do. It's, it's a cultural experience unlike anything I've ever seen. Like I just true. standing, just standing there looking at things would be incredible. Of the places I've been to, like, that is the one that felt the most like I was not at home. Yeah, like <laughs> it was that like is, the that most is... the most foreign things that I have seen. It was and like, I have never amazing. experienced that in Italy. It was like you could communicate with most everybody. Nothing seemed super unfamiliar. Everything was much, 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 much older. But yeah, and we were in like uh, major cities and stuff too. Yeah, yeah. So it, it seemed moderately familiar. Japan, mm -hmm. I feel like, would just be like another world, and that just fascinates me. And I would love to do that. So yes, that that would be what I would do for sure. And honestly. Not just the Tokyo International Pen Show, but they've got that giant Itoya building. They've got Maruzan, and you've got a bunch of different pen-centric yeah. things that I think that uh, for for a pen person, that's probably the place you can go to experience the most exciting, different. Like if there was a an area for an American pen nerd that is as close to kind of like pen Disney World as possible, it's probably Tokyo. Probably Tokyo. Yeah, I would, yeah. I, I, would I would agree with that. Yeah, and I haven't even been, but I know, but uh, like I already know that. So that would that would probably be my pick. Um, will I? Maybe, hopefully, one day. Maybe once all this COVID stuff is over, make it a little easier. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I I have, like Drew mentioned, I've been to several places. I've been to Japan. I've been to Italy a couple of times. I've been to Germany. Um, but uh, kind of like Drew mentioned, my fountain pen experience also started in conjunction with starting this business so i really can't decouple the two from each other um, the only thing that i can say is that because of the life stage i'm in you know with the kids and the whole thing and working a lot i'm really not traveling much for my hobbies you know i travel for work and i've kind of taken somewhat of a hobby passion and turned it into my career basically very conveniently. Um, but uh, other hobbies and interests I have, I, I really don't travel anywhere for those things. So I would just, the best assumption I can have is if I was in some other line of work, you know, I, I'm not gonna say I wouldn't be into fountain pens had I not discovered them the way that I did. There's no way to ever really know that. But I can pretty much assure you I wouldn't be traveling internationally purely as a hobby because I, have not done that for any other hobby outside of fountain pens. That's the best assumption that I can have. It's just, you know, it's pretty expensive for us to travel living in central Virginia to pretty much anywhere outside of the country because we're very far from any other country <laughs> where we are. Um, and just, you know, again, the whole kid thing is tough to leave. So, um, yeah, I mean, now that I have traveled though, I know that it's an amazing experience and it's good just like life experience to have. So, um, I would do that, but I, you know, traveling is really hard on Rachel too. So if she was all more like much more about some travel, we probably would be doing that more as a family, but it's really, it's really tough on her. So it's uh, that, that definitely impacts things a little bit. Um, but yeah, I mean, I definitely think if you can, there are definitely certain, certainly great 
reasons to travel about with people in the fountain pen world. I'll say I've done like meetups with people in all different parts of the world and met people from all over the world. And no matter pretty much what culture or anything that you're from, uh, people who are passionate about pens are passionate about pens and you have friends pretty much all over the world. So that I think is one of the coolest things about, you know, even just this whole subject matter. Um, so I think like, you know, to go just for a pen event is kind of tough for most folks, but if it's kind of thing like if you're already traveling somewhere for work or family or whatever, and you can sort of couple a travel with, you know, visiting some some pen places or around a pen show or whatever, um, it's not wasted effort. It's always a, a pretty you know life. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty positive life experience in my in my view. So yeah, very right, cool. Good question. Yeah, all right. All right. All right. Number three coming to us from Christian, and this is for you, Brian. Oh. Christian asks, you mentioned, you, Brian. I'm aware. You mentioned having a few pens the first time, having bought a few pens the first time, mm -hmm. and ones that you are still using now. Can you tell us which ones you bought, mm. which you are still using, and what made you keep using them or not? Hmm, okay. I mean, this is going back 13 years now. So many pens ago. Um, first pens that I first pens that I ever used, I don't really count because I was making pens and I used like kit parts from a fountain pen and those I was selling pens at the time. I don't even remember exactly which parts or which pens or whatever, you know. And so I, I don't really know how I would even answer that, but I, I, I'm pretty sure I don't have those very first pens. Uh, but the first ones that I ever bought, like commercially from, you know, a brand that makes fountain pens, not my own cobbled together stuff. Um, I placed one order for pens. I don't even remember where. Um, uh, I believe it was a Pelican script, uh, a Lamy Vista, um, I think with a fine nib. I'm not sure which nib. I think the script is a 1.0. Maybe I got a 1.5 too. Um, I was really into stubs, trying to learn what those were at the time. Um, I got a Lamy Joy. I think with the 1.5 and uh, Kaweco Classic Sport in clear because I wanted to try eyedroppering a pen and a Platinum Preppy as well for the same reason. And then I know early on I got a Pilot Petite one. I don't remember if that was one of the first pens I ever had. Maybe it wasn't now that I think about it. But um, anyway, so those were some of the first pens that I ever had. And, and honestly, most of the reasons I got those ones were kind of a little foretelling into my pen future, which was I want to get a variety of different brands and types of pens and nibs. And I want to try and, you know, gain the broadest experience that I know to gain, you know, so I got some desk pens, I got some pocket pens, I got them from different major brands. I wanted to eyedrop some, I wanted to have others that had cartridges and converters. And so I was even with my limited knowledge and limited budget at the time, I was trying to get the broadest experience I could um, with what I knew. And uh, so that's, that's what I got. And I still have all those pens. Um, I've not ditched any of them, but I'm also a bit of a hoarder. So I don't know if that really counts for much. Um, so um, those exact pens, you know, I still use them. Like I have them all. I reference pens for historic you know, purposes and doing videos and stuff like that. Um, most of the, uh, not all the pens, but some of those pens have actually changed a little bit. Some of the design elements have changed on them. Um, I'm thinking specifically the Platinum Preppy, um, the Pelican Script, we've carried, not carried, carried, not carried. Um, they might've changed a little bit. Uh, the Lamy Vista uses a different converter now. So some of that, you know, I think the Quago Classic Sport, the nib on it has changed and stuff like that. So some of them I don't use maybe quite as often just because of the nature of my work and the fact that I'm, you know, wanting to use things and reference things that are things that are still available to people, generally speaking. So a lot of times now I don't, I don't use my older pens nearly as much just on a regular basis, unless I'm, unless it's some really special pen or a limited edition thing where it's sort of a point in, point in time, period of history type of a pen. Um, you know, if it's, uh, you know, a still currently made pen model, but they've changed it and tweaked it and made some adjustments. I'm usually not using that pen anymore just because, you know, I want to be showcasing the current thing that you're going to 
you know be able to expect as a product um unless i'm you know comparing like if i i'll pull out my old like lamy pens and stuff like that if, if a new special edition comes out and i want to compare it to some older ones sure um but i'm not like daily carrying uh, some of those pens so you know my, my answer is a little bit nuanced i do use them to a degree but i'm not like inking up and carrying around those these days though i probably did for a good five six years in the beginning um, but of course, I've acquired so many other pens since then, and you know, it behooves me to know more about the modern pens that we're carrying. I'm definitely way more incentivized to carry around the newer pens so that I can speak to those better. Um, so, you know, my my older ones end up being, you know, a little more kind of in the archive, in the drawer, and I'll pull them out and reference them uh, when I need them. But you know, the the script I loved, I loved that nib. I hated the pen. The pen itself looks weird. The shape, I hated is, it the too. shape is odd. It's very light. I could never, the converter fit was always problematic. The converter fit was a real pain. You know, the converter just like was really, really weak. And I would drop it. I loved how it filled it. though. Yeah. Yeah. It did have the, um, it had the, the filler hole that was like closer mm-hmm. to the nib. Yeah. So it was like, it was a mixed bag with that script, but it was, yeah. a bit, it was an inexpensive pen. And it was, you know, it was a, it was a pretty inexpensive, um, you know, pen, but it mm-hmm. wrote really well. And the nib actually, it was a steel nib, but it was a little bit springy too. And it was fairly crisp. It was an all around pretty good writing experience, but I just, I hated the format of the pen. Um, but I use it. I had a whole slew of scripts that I used a lot in those early years because they were very affordable. I would ink them up with all different pen or I would ink, them, ink several pens with all different types of ink. And so I probably actually used that Pelican script the most of all the ones we're talking about here. But the Lamy Vista I used quite a bit too. Um, the Kuwaiko Classic Sport I use a little bit. Didn't love eyedroppering that one quite as much. Um, I enjoyed the Preppy more as an eyedropper pen for that one. So um, the Preppy, they're so cheap. I ended up, I mean, I must have like 50 Preppies. I don't even know over the years. So that particular one, I don't remember which one it is at this point. You can buy a new one every time one gets dirty and you don't have to clean it. Yeah, and like once Noodler started like putting them in, you know, with some of their pens, I would acquire a bunch. And so oh like, yeah, they know, were free in those pens I just ended up collecting a whole ton of them. Um, so yeah, I mean, I had really good experiences pretty much with all those pens. Um, I had no regrets uh, with any of them really. And it was, you know, helped to give me some basis and understanding and, and foundation to some of the earliest videos that you see. Those were some of the pens that I was using. And, uh, you know, I, I built everything, you know, from there. So that was honestly, the, that was at a time before, before we were selling pens for sure. Um, but I bought those probably six, four or six months before even selling fountain pen, any products, you know, cause I was still making my own pens at that point. Um, but then, you know, we were just selling ink and paper for a while and, uh, I was using, you know, pretty much primarily those pens until we started to get into more and I, you know, expanded my collection and so on. So yeah, no regrets. How about you, Drew? What were some of your first pens? My first pen was a Lamy All-Star in ocean blue. And Ooh. I still write. I still write with that one Solid. frequently. I, I I don't know if you remember, but earlier this year I used three all stars paired with this color: the blue, mm-hmm. the silver, and the pink. Nice. So that was in there. I, I carried that was my. Those were my three daily carries for a couple weeks. So I did use mm-hmm. my old blue Safari. Um, my next one after that was I did have an orange Pelican script. That one has waved bye bye a long time ago. But mm. either trashed it or burned it out of anger <laughs> and then i had a cp1 which i no longer have i gave that away um hmm. I, I don't i've mentioned this to you before but if i am ever gifted a pen i feel burdened with kindness so i often pay that forward and gift away a pen that i already have to somebody just so that because I, I have been the beneficiary of some gifts and i want to make sure that i'm putting that out there so that was one of those i was given a pen by somebody so i gave my cp1 away i just kind of pick a random pen and, like give it away no, I think that one was actually, I, I offered that one up as like a prize because I organized some like qu- quiz or something at work. And yeah, I think that's Crystal- one of the, surprisingly, that's, the CP1 is one of the more popular pens on our team. Yeah, I, I think Crystal ended up with it. But uh, yeah, gave that one away. And I don't recall uh, a pen after that. I, I, yeah, I, I got one of those Platinum Modern Machiers soon after that. I gave that one away too. Oh. I'm giving away. I've, yeah, I know. I, I, I give away some of my because I, I get I get gifts and I give so it's a I don't know, but I get, no, I, think I get gifts too and I hoard it all. <laughs> I'm like, I gotta, <laughs> like I gotta hang on to this for posterity. Yeah, no. I'd Meanwhile, like to I'm just like love. Scrooge McDuck. I just fill my swimming pool with <laughs> with fountain pens and swim around in them. 
but uh, oh, that that was actually one of the more um, you know we can we can bring this uh, question to a close. It's the Lamy uh, All Star in Ocean Blue. But okay. on another note, we had a bit of feedback from last week because I mentioned or both of us were talking about how Scrooge McDuck would meet a you know some sort of broken bone esque demise if he jumped into his coins. Someone in the YouTube comments from last week, I forget the name said that they actually addressed that in an old cartoon or comic from the 70s where Scrooge in the episode admitted that he had such a relationship with his money that when he dove in, they accepted him as one of their own and he could swim in them like they were liquid. But then in that episode, he lost his connection to money, so he was slamming into it and he couldn't swim in it anymore. But then in the episode, something happened and he regained that connection and he was swimming at the end again. So they Disney actually did address the physics behind the uh, the coin pool. So okay. I thought- I mean, he's also I'm, a talking duck. So, right, you know, exactly. You gotta, that's where you're, that's you where you're concerned. You like, a little bit. Right, but I, I was surprised that they actually did uh, address okay. that. Okay, so. nice, nice. Cool, all right, we got one more question. All right. Go for it. Oh, we got two more, man. Oh, we do, you're right. Oh yeah, all right. So Moises Amarquez, uh, favorite Robert Oster inks? Oh, good. That's a fun one. Um, I've been writing with more Robert Oster inks in 2022 than I ever have in previous years. So mm -hmm. I do have a couple favorites. But the first one that comes to mind was uh, actually provided to me by a comment on the YouTubes, and it was Cafe Crema. I don't recall what I was talking about. Probably browns because... I have done that once or twice of course, yeah. and it was recommended to me. And that's a beautiful, beautiful brown that has a nice amount of shading, but it's not too light. It's still a nice, rich brown. It really does look like uh, coffee with cream, which probably fires off some sort of synapse in my brain that pleases me. Mm -hmm. And then I've also been into Robert Oster's muted colors, like they're muted purples. Mm. And for I, I think it was because for a while, the thing that... I would see most out of Robert Oster. And I know this is very much someone else's cup of tea, but just all these blues, yeah. all these bright, vibrant blues. And I'm yeah. like, okay. I was like, this is fine, but. Yeah, give him more, give, bring him more, no, keep, keep him going. A blue is a blue, right? You come it's, out with more like, and everybody would be like, another like blue, deep no, blue with a red so, sheen. I was like, heck yeah, keep him coming, kept Robert. I seeing all these blues. <laughs> and then this year I realized that Robert Oster also does, it's obvious they do blues well. Like, obviously, they, they look amazing. But I found out that they did these kind of subdued purples really well also. Mm. Um, talking specifically about Violet Dreams and Summer Storm. I've been using both of those. And then Violet Clouds is like the shimmer version of, you know, in that same family. And that one looks amazing as well. And... Crystal Marine is also a shimmer one that I've kind of fallen in love with recently. Mm. Specifically, the thing that I found the most interesting about Crystal Marine and subsequently the other shimmer inks that I've used from Robert Oster is that on Tomoe River anyway, which is what I you know experiment with shimmer inks usually so that I can see just how good they can look, the shimmery particles don't rub off as much as some of the other shimmer inks that I've used. Yeah. And I found that was really cool because the shimmer particles are physical particles that you can see. So they're not going to penetrate the paper fibers in the way that dye and water do, obviously. So they sit much more on the surface than the other components within that ink, mostly to the point where you can kind of thumb them off. The Robert Oster ones, they don't rub off quite as much. So I'm led to believe that the actual particulate is finer than some of the other types of ink, which might penetrate the uh, paper fibers more, or there's some sort of adhesive in there that just sticks it to the paper. Either way, I didn't find that they rubbed off as much. I haven't experimented mm -hmm. with it really hardcore to like, really see what survives a friction test or what doesn't. All I know is that hmm. I took my thumb to it and it mostly stayed on. There's a little bit on my thumb, but it didn't create a smear on the page. And I was like, whoa, what? Because I remember recently, I don't remember what brand, so I'm not gonna throw anybody under the bus. But the last shimmer ink I used from another brand absolutely smeared across the page, like visibly hmm. on the page, not just on your thumb. So I know that I was really happy with. I mean, there's no throwing under the bus. We're not criticizing, it's just reality. Like I think the, um, I think the private reserve inks have a, a lot of shimmer in them. They do. 
And a lot of it ends up, so I don't know if it's like a size particulate thing. Cause again, they don't really, they don't really tell us any, you know, what these things actually are. Um, we are just kind of, you know, you look at it and you're like, oh, it seems like, you know, Pelican, their golden barrel seems like a really fine particulate or like Robert Osher seems like a fine particulate, you know, as opposed to like uh, the Diamond Shimmer Tastic feels like it's a little chunkier, you know, how much yeah, is it even the case? I don't really know. Just yeah, what it seems I don't know. Like. Ja- Jacques Rabanne seems to be a little bit more chunkier too, but there's also a lot less in there. If right. you look at the, I think the, the volume the of it of, has to do, yeah. Yeah, think, the amount of particulate inside of like, you know, Pelican Golden Barrel, for example, like there's a ton of shimmer in there. You shake up something like Emerald of Shavor, you might not see any of it at all. It's it's, it's a very tiny bit yeah. compared to some of the other shimmer shimmery shimmers yeah i would have i would have to believe given that it's you know essentially a pigment the more of it you have in there the more you're going to get that smearing stuff because it's like you know i I don't know that any of it's really absorbing into the paper but you know paper not paper to whatever degree of smoothness the paper is there is still a texture to it so when you have a particulate that's happening it's not actually absorbing into the paper but is going to kind of sit in some of the microscopic nooks and crannies you're going to have on the surface of the paper so yeah, you can like press on there and really rub and get any, you know, shimmering ink to smear. But I think if you've got a certain degree of saturation or maybe some of the larger particulate, you know, it's not going to hide in those nooks and crannies and it's just going to smear with even a lighter touch or just, you know, with any contact, it might smear off just because there's so much of it there just on the surface. So. What I think surprised <laughs> me a lot was when I was experimenting with Crystal Marine specifically, mm-hmm. it was one of those instances where I just dipped a glass pen in it. So I got a mm-hmm. full shimmer, like every word was just all 100% shimmer. And mm-hmm. I've had ones where I'm writing with it inked up in my pen, so you're getting some shimmer, but this was like all shimmer. And it still didn't have a ton of smear. I was expecting mm-hmm. way more than I got. So either way, I was really happy with that. And going forward, I will not be, I'm normally a little bit more apprehensive to try shimmer inks. I will be less apprehensive about Robert Oster shimmer inks. So I was really happy with those. Good to know. Um, the Shake and Shimmy, Shake and Shimmer, Shake and Shimmy. I think he calls them Shake, Shake and Shimmy, Shimmy, doesn't he? I think so, yeah. yeah. The Shake and Shimmy inks. And then I wanted to mention Citrus. That's one of my more uh, recent favorites as well. Robert Oster Citrus is really bright and fun. Hmm. And then I have one ink on my to-do list. I need to finish up at least two out of my three pens here before I ink up anything else. Uh, but Honey Bee is my next to do on Robert Oster's mm-hmm. ink list. So I really want to try that one out because it looks pretty. Nice. Uh, I'm glad you've tested more of them. I have sadly not tested as many of the Robert Oster's as of late. Part of that you've is because few, some I've blues and some blues and some blues. Well, that's the thing is like probably <laughs> 95% of the Robert Oster inks I've used have all been blues. Yeah, it's you like, know, why would I try like, anything else when they've got all like, these great blues? I know, that's what I'm talking about. I mean, they have a lot uh, of other great colors, but I don't know. And plus I have like a couple that I really love and it's like, I just, I never want to, I'm not wanting for anything. So, um, you know, I would have to intentionally like, go and, and uh, you know, try something different just for the sake of trying it. So, um, but you know, you've covered it so well, Drew. It's just, uh, it's not as pressing for me to do that. But um, anyway, Blue Water Ice is my my go-to Robert Oster. I've talked about it many times. Um, and so, yeah, I do do enjoy that quite a bit. I've definitely definitely gone through a bottle of that. I don't go through many bottles of ink, but that is one I have, I have um, completed. Uh, also love Fire and Ice. That is definitely, I think, if not the most popular Robert Oster, it's up there. Um, another kind of blue. It's a little, little more on the teal side, not quite as true, you know, lighter blue as the blue water ice. So it's different enough. Um, but fire and ice is really good. It's got a little heavier sheen than blue water ice does, but the, the shading is pretty great on both of those. So I really enjoy, uh, both of those, but, um, lately I've been, you know, I've got some of the sailor monos, honestly, since the sailors have come out, I've been using those a little bit more trying to get to know ever since we came out, we had like the original sailor line and then we had the ink studio that came out was a hundred colors that we got all at once. And then the Monyo and, you know, just the sailor has been keeping us really busy with ink and now we got Ferris wheel press. And so, um, it's been a little bit harder, a little bit harder for me to go into the back catalog, uh, a bit, but, uh, you know, there's still a lot of great colors. I love Robert Oster inks and I find them to be a little lower maintenance too. Like not, not as much hardcore cleaning as you get to do yeah. with some other brands. So really, really good balance of dyes and, 
and uh, just the components that are used and very thoughtful company as well, like zero waste plastic, you know, facility and that type of stuff. So just a lot of respect for Robert Oster and um, as a brand as a whole. So definitely worth taking a look. We, there are plenty of colors out there that are currently available from Robert Oster. So if we don't carry one that you'd really like to see, leave us a comment. Maybe we can pick it up. Yeah. All right. All right. We've got one final question for real this time. This comes okay. <laughs> from KC2NPU. And KC asks, what is the difference between the Twisby 580 and the Twisby Eco? And this person asked it twice. So I was like, you know what? Let's let's do it. All right. Um, sounds like you should just buy one of each and you'd know yourself. They're pretty affordable pens. Um, but no, I'm just kidding. Not really, but I'm, yeah. Um, I'll still answer the question. Um, so five, 580, I would consider more of like the flagship pen of the Twisby line. Uh, technically, if you want to say, oh, the flagship's got to be the most expensive pen, that would be the VAC 700R. But uh, really, the 580 is so vastly more popular than the VAC 700R. And it was, you know, more the original, you know, Twisby diamond pen that came out. It's got the diamond shape to the the barrel and the cap. So um, I think the, the 580 is the, you know, iconic Twisby pen design. Uh, so that's that's definitely you know, more of the go-to Twizzy pen, I think. And it came out first, you know, years before the Eco did. Um, both of them are piston. Uh, they both have several different nib size choices. Um, and they're going to write pretty similarly as well. Um, the nib is going to be slightly bigger in physical size on uh, the 580. It's more of like a number five standard size nib as opposed to a number four standard size. So it's slightly smaller on the Eco. They're not swappable between each other. Um, but uh, nice thing about the 580 is it's got a removable grip section. So you can swap... You know, you can disassemble the pen a little bit more. You can actually buy replacement grip and nib, you know, sections for the 580 and you can swap them if you already have the pen and you just want to get a different nib. Um, so that's kind of cool. They don't have that for the Eco. The Eco, the grip is all integrated. You can pull out the nib and feed, but you can't swap it and they don't sell spares. So a little more versatility maybe with the, the 580. Um, I think the 580 is all around. It looks a little more robust, feels maybe a bit more robust. It's got more like metal parts on the trim and stuff like that. It just looks a little more polished. The finials look a little nicer. The logo in the top cap of the finial looks really, really good. Um, a little more plain on the Eco. So, uh, you know, all around the Eco is still a very solid pen, but it's, you know, um, a little more than half the price of the 580. So it's, a, it's you know, it's an not an ignorable difference in in price um, but both very very solid pens for that matter um, the eco rather than having like the diamond shape on the body it's just got a round body and it's got a hexagonal cap um, and i believe the the plastic that's used is slightly different between the two as well still both very sturdy both very hardy plastics um, but i it's just i think it's just slightly different on the eco for whatever reason um, one thing i do like about the eco though is it's got a transparent grip so you can actually see the feed you can see the nib in there which i think is pretty cool um you've got you know basically a black um like feed housing that the the nib and feed fit into on the 580 so it's you know depending on which version you buy it does have a clear grip um on the 580 but all you're seeing is the the nib housing you're not actually seeing the ink flowing through the feed i actually some people hate that you know because they don't want to see like the ink in there with like bubbles and, you know, they just sort of draw them crazy. So they don't like clear grips. I like clear grips. So I want to see, you know, what's going on in there. I like the chaos that happens as the ink kind of flows down through. So I actually like that about the Eco better than the 580, but that's just me. Um, and then uh, let's see here, both of them. Uh, see so yeah, they write really well, blah, blah, blah. They got a lot of fun color variants. They've done, you know, Twisby over the years has done all kinds of special editions and other variants. Um, they've done probably... I don't know, maybe they've done more colors. I would have to go through and actually catalog them all. Probably more color variants on the Eco, um, but there's there's a, a wider variety of variants overall on the 580 because you've got the 580 AL, which has some aluminum components, the ALR, which has some other, you know, differences to it as well. So you've got, you know, maybe a few, I don't know, it's like a little more versatility maybe in the 580, but probably not a whole ton. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so slightly different pens, but overall pretty similar experience. You get to see the ink sloshing around your pen either way. It writes pretty solid either way. So, yeah, I think they're both a great bang for their buck, and I could easily recommend either pen or both to pretty much anybody who's into them. So I think if you're, whichever one strikes your fancy more, you know, go for it, and I doubt you'll regret it. So, I agree with that. I have nothing else to add. All right. That's fact. 
Sweet. All right, that's our Q&A. Now we're going to move on to a hypothetical question from me. All right, Drew. I have a whole spreadsheet of different like icebreakers and would you rathers and all that kind of stuff. I looked through a bunch of them and I was like, yeah, just not feeling any of these. So I just like Googled this and found this random one and then sort of tweaked it and came up with it. So it's sort of a custom Googled Brian tweaked hybrid hypothetical question that I okay. would be, thought would be kind of fun to answer. Okay. All right. So here's the scenario and y'all can play along at home too and think about what you would do for yourselves. So you find a book and you start reading it to discover that it is a book that is giving you an exact account of your entire life. So you open it up, it's your birth, all of your memories. It's literally a biography of your whole life. But you get to the point in the book where you're reading the book right now. So you basically catch up to the present, but you realize that there is more left in the book. Do you continue to read ahead knowing that you'll know every aspect of your life, including how you're gonna die? And do you believe that your knowledge of the future would do anything to influence what happens in the book or not? So basically, if you could learn the future of the rest of your life, would you? And do you think whether you chose to or not, would that influence what actually happened? What do you think, Drew? So if I, if the book says, you know, if I'm, if I'm reading it, will everything I do just magically appear in the book as in real time? No, you, it, everything that's in the book is an account of what is going to happen for the rest of your life. It's not, so, it's so not that means even, you can, so that means you can't change it then. I don't know. Do you think you could change it? It would be the well, question. Well, no, I'm asking like if it says it's, the you'll basically learn the future. So that mm -hmm. means it's already written. So I, I sort of coupled the questions in there together. One would basically, would you choose to learn what would happen the rest of your life or not? That's really part number one. Well, that depends on whether or not I can change it. If I can change it, then yeah, absolutely. I'd want to not do stupid things or mistakes or, you know, anything disaster that could harm somebody. I guess but if, that's, that's, if more I the, that's more the ethereal question is if you knew what was supposed to happen, is your knowledge of that giving you the ability to change it or would your knowledge of it actually be the thing that causes you to do that. I don't know. That could be just some like final destination crap. I don't want to like- That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. Um, so no, so the, the, basically, no, I wouldn't want to know what happened. I don't even want to watch. I like, they just had the San Diego Comic-Con. I'm not even watching the trailers for all the Marvel movies because I'm going to see them anyway. Why would I need to, yeah, I don't, I don't, I'd rather experience them. So like my life, it's going to happen anyway. Why would I, if I can't do anything about it, like Marvel, like I can't, if I can't see it yet, why am I going to spoil some of the events? So mm. if I can't do anything about the future, then why bother? But if you're saying that if I did know about these events, I would be able to prevent them, then yeah, I would want to know about them. Mm. So if I can change it, then yeah, of course. I'd like to make sure that if I can avoid a car crash or something, then I sure I would like to do that. But if you're saying that no matter what it does, if I if I read it and try to change something, it's automatically going to update into a new timeline or something like that, then there really is no way you can know what the future holds. So the book is kind of pointless because you can change it and the book is going to ever update. It might, you're saying that the book is going to be pre-written in one timeline, but if you change something and alter what's written, then now the book is on a different timeline. It's just going to be continuously altering. So it really means nothing and can't tell the future. That is the great debate, right? Like if you knew the future, do you then have the ability to change a future? And then is what you knew, is that even the future? Like it gets you- It depends on whether or not you're talking twist. about alternate timelines or one continuous timeline. But <sighs> if you're talking about timeline tangents, then everything you do depends on whether or not you follow back to the future roles or back to the future rules or Marvel rules. You either, if you're back to the future rules, then you have, you know, you can screw up the timeline. If it's Marvel rules, you create, well, no, I guess both of them create different timelines. Mm. Yeah, so it depends on what timeline the book is following. If I make a change and the book is telling me the future, am I now creating a new timeline that the book will update or will the book still say what the old book said? I think the book, is, the book is going to say exactly what happens. So you might, okay, read, well then, you might read it and say, you know, Drew is reading this book right now and he's reading ahead to his future and, you know, he finds out that he's going to die in 12 days and it drives him completely insane and... Now he's questioning, you know, like you would be reading the book and it would be very meta because you would be 
reading about your own reaction to learning about what's happening in the future, wouldn't you? I guess. I mean, that that that's it's your hypothetical, so I don't know. It depends on what what this imaginary <laughs> book is actually doing. It could it could the book's also not doing be like, anything. Okay. The book is just telling you what's happening, what's actually what actually happens. But it doesn't tell you what ha- what happens in the future. No, it does. But, but if you, you just keep re- if you just if you keep reading the book, all it's going to tell you is you keep reading the book. No, but you're reading ahead. It's not like you're reading it in real time. Okay, you're so not, you skip to the very end, and it shows you. It sh- says you're going to get true. in a car crash next week. I didn't think about that. I guess you could just skip to the end. You could be like, "Well, I don't really want to read everything that's going to happen." But yeah, you could skip. Maybe to I'll the skip end. ahead so like twenty s- pages and just kind of see like one little glimpse. Right. So obviously, you could you could say, "Okay, well, that day I'm going to stay home," and you could avoid the car crash. That's the question. It's not a question. Like, are you saying that? I'm saying if the book tells you the future and it says you're getting a car crash, you could just stay home that day, right? Or are you saying that the book can't be changed? So No, you wouldn't be able to change it because you would be reading what would actually be happening. So you would read like, you would read like Drew reads that he's going to be in a car crash, so he decides to stay home, but he doesn't realize the car crashed into his house. And because that, that, he so, stayed so, so, home, well, he then, died in, in that the car case, crash. In that case, you've, you've <laughs> rendered the book completely pointless then. So the book has no meaning. I guess it is like a final destination type of a thing. Yeah. Like, so 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 then no, the book is completely pointless now. I wouldn't know. It's just all all, all the book is telling you is what's happening right now. So you're basically just reading what's happening at present. <laughs> you're just so, forever you're just forever reading and yeah. reading the book, and now he's reading this no. sentence, and now he's reading but, that sentence, and now I, he smells I think popcorn, I, and now he's back to reading this sentence. Yeah. I, <laughs> I, th- this is a very nuanced question that would be really hard to answer because of like all of the all of the clarifying questions that would need to happen it was meant to be more of a discussion than it was so like, yeah singular like, answer. broad 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 strokes <laughs> um unless if i can protect my friends my family myself or any innocent bystanders then yes i would like to have the opportunity to change that or to be better um if i can't then no screw it i'm not gonna spoil it for me i'm gonna live my life and see what happens Hmm. So it really depends on whether or not I can change anything. If yes, I will read. If not, I will not. What about you? I don't know. I mean, I'm I'm very much of a, uh, you know, I'm not into like spoilers and that type of thing. I don't even have any desire. You know, if there's like a show, like you mentioned, mm-hmm. if there's a show or a movie or something, I'm like, yeah, okay, I'm like kind of curious, but I'm like, I'm not going to go out of my way to try to learn stuff in advance. And spoil, yeah, for, especially if you know you're going to see it anyway. The new Bond movie comes out like, all right, yeah, I'm going to see it eventually. Why am I going to? watch ahead yeah i'm yeah. not i don't i don't need to be advertised to yeah so you, i don't you know get, you basically already have my money <laughs> yeah but i don't know i don't know what i would do honestly because i'm thinking about like well if i did read ahead then you know if i kind of knew like okay i got like 30 years left all right like i'm gonna make the absolute most of those 30 years but if i read and it's like oh i got six years left i'm like well i'm gonna make the most of those six years you know what i mean like i think <laughs> i would try to make thing. i would try to make the most of it pretty much no matter what the actual yeah. outcome was like i wouldn't necessarily try to change it i would just be like oh okay if this is what's going to happen then i'm just going to live my life you know the best that i can for the time that i have so i don't know i don't know i don't know i don't know what i would do i asked my own question and made it really confusing and now i don't even have my own answer so <laughs> okay i guess this is why i don't ask as many hypothetical questions as you do drew <laughs> you're better at them than i am but anyway I thought the question was compelling. So, um, yeah, I'll say I'll say no. I would, if I have to actually make a decision, I would say no. I probably don't want to know what actually happens, because um, I feel like just knowing that I would probably overthink it and then end up just going insane. Because then I would be like the only person that knows, and I couldn't relate to anybody, and I'd be all paranoid and stuff. So, without actually having a scenario, I'd say nah. I'm I'm pretty content where I am. But then, all right. But then you just like have that book, and you just know that it's in there. You'd be just like, what do you do with that book? You just like keep it on your bookshelf the rest of your life. Could somebody else read it? Like, if one of my I kids, don't even, if you could, if one of my kids picked up the book and they read it, would then they know what happens to me too? I didn't even think about that. I don't know that the, that the book mm. is full of hypothetical contradictions. It's a mysterious, Who knows? Mysterious can't can't trust can't can't trust the book. <laughs> All right. Anyway, that was my attempt. Let's move on. Okay. <laughs> All right. We're gonna do a pen spotlight on the Kaweco All Sport now. Back to the pen thing. All right, Drew. This is a fun one, Brian. Literally, this is a fun pen, if that's what you're getting at. So, yeah, the Allsport. So, I mean, yeah. yeah. I will say one. this name is one of the more confusing ones 
because it often can get confused with Lamy, the All-Star, and um, you know they have the classic sport, the ice sport, the all sport. So it does take a little bit of thinking to remember like, which pen is this again? But it's basically, um, yeah, I think all was originally aluminum because they started out with aluminum versions, but now they also have brass and copper versions too. But basically they're the metal Kaweco pocket pens. Right? I don't think they call those the all sports though. Do they? That's I don't a, think so. They they have a new one that just came out called the Brass Sport, and they just call that oh, the Brass yeah. Sport. You know what? I think you might be right. Maybe the All Sport yeah. is just the aluminum ones now that I think about yeah. them. Hmm. Okay. Well, there you go. So these so, are aluminum pens with, um, I don't know, is it anodized finishes? I never want to say anodized unless I know that it actually is. I don't know I if it's lacquered know. or anodized, but it's it's a pow- think it's, it's a coated finish. Coated yeah. finish. Yeah. It's definitely coated. One thing that I am, have always been fascinated about this these pens, Brian, is mm. how kind of soft they feel. I don't know how to explain it, but mm. with this one, the uh, the purpley one, the uh, I don't know what would, what was it, cappuccino or espresso? That brown one we had last year. That was a good one. They 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 feel they don't feel like cold metal. They feel like they have a softness to them. So mm. I don't know. If they're just, um, is it like a visual trick though? Because it's like that matte, I don't matte kind of finish. Like it kind of, I, it's a little glowy. Yeah, it almost I don't, looks soft. It, yeah. it, I don't know. I don't know if it's a visual thing or if hmm. it's a real thing. But either way, they they don't have like they feel soft. They don't feel cold. They have like a almost a warmth to them, hmm. and they're not. None of the lines are severe or sharp. So. Hmm. As far as metal pens go, it just seems like a very soft, inviting <laughs> metal pen. I don't know. It's 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 very pleasant. Hmm. It's very pleasant. Uh, they kind of have to be posted, of course, because these are more or less pocket pens. But I, I think that there is there whatever it is, there's something special about the way this metal is finished on these all sports. And I've said this before on a pen cast, and I know at least somebody has said, I know what you're talking about, Drew. So I know I'm not the only one. I can't describe it, but it's a thing. It's real. I feel confident in that. Um, they're really pretty and they're a lot of fun. Do you, do you, do you have any idea what I'm talking about? Or am I just I know what totally... you're talking about. No, 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 okay. absolutely. Because I, okay. So, okay, we have a couple different versions of this, right? So we have the one that's the raw, which right, is the, basically like a polished aluminum. Right, that does not feel like this. That doesn't, it, it, it doesn't no. look or feel as soft. Right. So I don't know, I, I think part of it is like a Jedi mind trick that like just the visual of the softness of the lines and the way the light kind of bounces off the matte finish just makes it look softer. So I think that's part of it. But I think I think also, you know, just again, maybe just the matte finish or the fact that it's a coated and not just like a raw metal. Maybe it, it doesn't have as much of that kind of cold to the touch kind of a feel to it. I don't really know. And aluminum in general, I will say, as opposed to other types of pens like brass and copper and stuff like that, aluminum is a metal that dissipates heat really well. So even if it's a pen that, you know, would be colder, like say you left it out in your car in the winter time or something and it's cold, you know, as soon as you touch it and start using it, it's actually going to absorb the heat from your hand, um, it, you know, a little yeah. bit. So, you know. Well, that's what that's what uh, heat sinks are made out of aluminum, right? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. And in fact, even just in like my adventures in welding, like welding aluminum is a whole different beast than welding steel just because of how quickly it, um, it dissipates the heat. So um, it's a very different type of metal than uh, most of the other metals. So even just like the, the feel, the, so I think the texture matters, but then I think the... Um, you know, as with with any aluminum pen, I think you're gonna you're gonna have an interesting um, time with like the temperature of it. It's not gonna be as maybe severe as some of the other uh, some of the other pens out there. Yeah, they're, it's really comfortable, and I really like the the way it feels in your hand. It is you do really need to feel it to understand what I'm talking about. If you own one, you know, I know you know, but <laughs> there is something very very unique about this. This is the rose gold one I have here. We also have a red one right now, and we still have the um, I don't, we have is the it, violet. The, uh, the, the, is it violet? Yeah. So that yeah, we have the rose gold, and then there's a vibrant violet and uh, vibrant violet. Yes. Yeah. There's the deep red, and then we also have the raw, the the, yeah. the shiny aluminum one. 
You know, that, that that violet. If I if I bought one right now, I would probably buy that violet one. That's a really nice color. That look that one looks very soft. Because I missed the brown one. Looks very crush crush my very, soul, but I missed pillowy. the brown one. Yeah. Yes. Very pillowy. Yes. Pillowy. Yeah. That's 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 this pen. Is that and they the way come to in describe cool, it. They come in cool tins. Yeah. Now the thing I will say, I for a long time, I kind of discounted these pens a little bit to be honest with you. Now this was years ago before they really honed in their uh, mini converter. Um, so back when they did not have a very reliable mini converter, I didn't love that you could only use a standard international short cartridge with these pens. So especially because they're aluminum, aluminum corrodes with contact with ink over for a long time. So you, um, you would want to eye drop these pens. You basically got to use a cartridge or a converter. And at the time there was no good converter. So now they've got a better mini converter. It holds very little ink. So I, I personally, I would rather just use cartridges or refill cartridges with a syringe. Um, but that's, that's gonna be your option for using it. So I will say if, you know, especially if you're trying to use inks that don't come in cartridges, it's a little less convenient. So for that aspect, you know, I'm not like all in on these pens, but I, I do like the, the the weight of these pens as opposed to just the plastic ones you know it's not super heavy like when you get into like other versions they've had like the brass and copper and stuff like that those get some more substantial weight but the aluminum ones are nice because they're a little heavier but not too heavy um i love the matte finish on them i think it, it looks awesome and it does feel really good in the hand um and uh yeah i just uh not a bad pen not a bad pen at all and i did something similar to you when i was hmm. When I jumped into Caveco and I got a blue um, ice sport as mm -hmm. my first one, and then I think I got another green one, and then I got a Fox uh, Skyline, Skylight, whatever. Not, what do they call those things? Skyline. Skyline. All right. Nightline, mm -hmm. Moonlife. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I was never, I was always inconvenienced by the fact that I had to use cartridges. And I guess not so much with the Fox, but with the original ones, the amount of cartridges available at the time was not near That's the true. amount that are currently available. That's true. Now, I don't mind cartridges at all. In There's fact, a, yeah. uh, most of them are like refilling a cartridge is in many ways way quicker and easier than refilling and cleaning a converter. To clean a converter is often a little bit more difficult than cleaning a cartridge because with a cartridge, you can stick a syringe in there, spray the heck out of it, you're done. There's no piston for anything to get stuck behind. Nothing would ever need to be disassembled. It's fast, it's easy, and I'm and the, your ink selection is just it's just as good as it is with bottles and samples yeah. if you are refilling it. So it's true. I've been I've been way cooler with cartridges and refilling cartridges than I was mm -hmm. when I first jumped into Caveco. So I need to start writing with mine a little bit more. I wrote with my Fox just very, very little. So I need to jump back mm. into that. Which but, uh, uh, which nib size would you be inclined? Because these are, so they're steel nibs, extra fine, fine, medium, and broad. Mm -hmm. Which one would you be inclined to uh, grab in this I, format? Of I really don't care. Uh, I think that it being, I, if I were to use this as a travel pen, mm -hmm. then I would go with fine as yeah. fine as possible. But since I don't, the, I just write with them at my desk. I don't care, like whatever. Okay. Because I'm I'm not, if, if I'm writing a letter, then the bigger nib I have, I just adjust my spacing to fit the nib that I'm using. So I'm not under anyone else's constraints other than my own where yeah. I'm using fountain pens. But if I were to keep this as my travel pen to write under other constraints, then yeah, fine, as yeah. fine as possible for sure. Yeah, so I'm. I mean, extra fine is okay. I would probably lean towards fine for myself for these, because um, again, the finer the nib you use, too, the longer the ink is going to last you. So mm -hmm. if you are having to refill cartridges, a little less convenient. You know, going if you go with broad and you're using a ton of ink, then you got to refill it more often. So I would be a little more inclined. I, you know, generally speaking, I don't like to use extra fines as much unless I am really trying to write on something thin. So. You know, I'd be more inclined to have something fine because this is better all around. It's going to show ink a little bit better. It's still going to write, you know, on, on most uh, uh, rulings pretty tightly. So, but uh, yeah, all around. I mean, the nibs write well. They're not like nothing to write home about too much. I mean, they're all around pretty decent. Um, 
I know on some of the nibs, some they use box, some they use Yovo. We don't really distinguish as much. I think they kind of mix and match, depends on the pen. I don't know specifically about the All Sport, but I know Kaweco, they make a lot of pens globally. So I think they, they will use, um, kind of switch between the two, especially in recent years. I think, you know, um, with nib, nib supply and just shortages and stuff like that, I think they hedge a little bit and they kind of will source from both. Um, but both are reputable makers. So, um, yeah, I think that uh, we've, you know, had maybe some slight inconsistencies with some of the Quaco nibs over the years, but nothing pervasive, nothing, um, um, you know, troublesome or anything. I think it's just, you know, you pretty much use one and, and use, and, you know, I've like tried to switch, swap them between different pens over the years. I've never noticed any compatibility issues or anything like that. So whatever, even if they're sourcing them from different places, they're, they're getting them pretty tight tolerances and getting them pretty, yeah. uh, pretty and that, that's been the only inconsistency I've noticed is not an inconsistency in, like quality, just an inconsistency in, all right, this one seems to be made a little bit different. This one's putting down a slightly different line here or there over the years, but. Yeah, we'll, we'll get like random feedback from people. Like I have this pen, it lights very slightly dry here with this ink. And then it's like, we never hear like much of the same feedback twice. So I think some of it, you know, kind of just falls into, you know, yeah. pens vary a little bit <laughs> with themselves. Yeah. Um, so yeah. never, never pegged down any particular issue, but you know, that is one thing like we would love to normally advertise, which you know, nib a manufacturer uses or whatever, but I think they've like switched and flopped and changed and stuff over the years. So cool. All right. That's pretty much all I got on this pen. So go check those out. If you're interested, check out all the Quaker line, but, uh, the all sports, I think are, you know, they're, they're more of a premium, but, uh, in my opinion, I think it's, it's worth it. If you like the color. Yes, indeed. All right. Nonsense time, Drew. What's happening? All right. I'm going to start by saying last episode, we were asked whether or not our children were fountain pen fans and we <laughs> encouraged that. Yep. That, that night I go home. Cause I said on the pen cast, I was like, Oh my God, I haven't made my kid write anything over the summer. He just hasn't written anything. He's got a math app that he uses. You know, we make sure he reads, but writing we have like been totally slacking on. So I went home that day after we recorded, I was like, he said, Hey, can I watch TV? I was like, write something first. <laughs> write something. I don't care what you write. Just, just, just write something. He's like, okay, I'll do a story. I'm like, great, do a story. And he went to pick up his Twisby swipe. And hey. he hasn't picked it up since, I don't know, sometime during the school year. Worked right away. Perfectly. I'm telling you, swipe city all day long. And he wrote a little story. But that was the day I said, I don't know. He doesn't really write with it all that much. But that's exactly what he did. He went right to it. So Nice. He did it. He wrote with his fountain pen. Hooray. Loved it. In fact, he while he was writing, he's like, man, fountain pens are so cool. And I was like, why? <laughs> yes, they are. That is a fact, sir. And uh, but anyway, that was that was last week. As far as the weekend goes, it was it was eventful. Um, I mentioned that uh, I was going to need to be exposed to the heat and and I was. Uh, and unfortunately, it was very, very, very hot. My brother's birthday had occurred so as a celebratory affair we visited top golf and my brothers and i my two brothers and i uh drove some balls and got mad at them so mm -hmm. that worked i had coffee they had alcohol and fun was had i uh you know it was they have some fans going at top golf but it's it's not enough. It's not enough. <laughs> it's, it just feels like you're got like a blow dryer on you. It's like blowing yeah, hot air. Yes. It's 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 still it was still warm. It wasn't the so we just you know. What was it like ninety five degrees or something that day? I don't Fahrenheit? know. A thousand. It's, a thousand. It's so <laughs> we went we went early and then uh, we did about mm, did about hour and a half two hours there maybe and my hand still hurt by the way I was we we did it a lot. But it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun, and I, I always like going there. And then after that, we went to get barbecue. We went to ZZQ downtown, which Ooh. you know you've, you've been there. That's that's delightful the place is and fantastic. delicious. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's always packed there. So I didn't know if we were going to get a seat. It was one of those places where you're mm -hmm. in line, you're trying to see like, okay, that's open now, but there's like ten people in front of me, so that's probably not going to be open. So we're all like, I don't know, should gotta, we get this to go? You gotta, or should we no, you gotta split the group and have somebody go plant down at the I table. I know, we should have done that. We didn't know what to, it's ordering there is weird because it's not like- yeah, you don't know what they're oh, gonna I, have, yeah. Right, you like, you can't just order a combo. You're like, all right, I want a half pound of this, a quarter pound of that. And mm -hmm. so I don't, none of us had the confidence to order for the other person, so. But we yeah. got lucky, we did, we did have, we did find a seat, but it was after we all kind of agreed that we would get it to go, so. 
we didn't have any plates or trays or anything like that. So we were just like eating off the paper and uh, one person had a tray, the other two did not. So Zach ended up eating off of my tray with me and Chad was the only one with silverware. So we were using plastic. So, you know, we you all could had go a- back and ask, like you're at the mm-hmm. restaurant. You don't, like, don't, 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 don't use logic with me, Brian. I mean, get, get out of here with that. No, it was just funny. We didn't care. Bunch of, bunch of maniacs anyway. Uh, <laughs> so that was fun. And then we walked a couple of blocks, a couple of blocks, like five blocks. It was actually too, too many blocks in the heat <laughs> to, uh, blocks. I know. On a, to full, their bar- favorite, on a full barbecue belly. <laughs> I know. Oh yeah. Well, I was like, I was like, Hey guys, let's, let's, let's get this out. Let's go for a walk. And they're like, eh, okay. But we, I was, we wanted to walk. My brothers are both vinyl record nerds, so we wanted to walk to one of their favorite record shops, which coincidentally is owned by the same two guys that own a retro video game shop that I frequent. And both in the retro video game shop and in the record shop, they have a little back room with pinball games. Mm. So I was like, yes, let's go to the record store, gentlemen, so you can have records. Meanwhile, I'm like, yes, pinball. So I played pinball. They looked at records, but uh, my nice. they, they they there was no AC in there, so they got hot really quickly. So Oof. we're like, all right, we're leaving. I didn't really get my money's worth, but that's fine. It's not my birthday, <laughs> so we we got out of there. And my brothers were dying, so they wanted to go to a brewery. So we went to a brewery. They had some whatever beers, IPAs, stouts, whatever beer happens. I don't Hop, know hops and barley. They had hops and barleys, and I had a can of iced coffee because it was like the only non-alcoholic thing they had in there. So, yay! That was fine. We just sat there and talked. It was it was a delightful, delightful day. And then the uh, UFC, the free UFC fights started at 3, so we went over to Chad's and watched some fights. And then I went right home. After that, I had like 10 minutes before it was Shannon's time to leave for her show that Archer and I left with her because we wanted to get good seats because it's a free event and you need to plop down your picnic blanket or whatever and get Mm -hmm. a good spot. So we sat outside waiting for her show to start. It was a musical. She's in the Adams Family musical. Uh, And we sat there for an hour and a half just sitting there. Um, I brought brought a cooler. I brought the Aztec cooler. That nice. <laughs> used to used to belong in the car. Yes, sir. Getting the job done still. Nice. Yeah. From the from the grave, um, and uh, I let him bring the switch, and I played my you know PlayStation Vita. So we just sat there playing video games like a couple of sweaty dorks uh, <laughs> out on the lawn and um, eating Cheetos and waiting for her show to start. So finally, it starts after an hour and a half. And oh, wait, that was before the show started. You were there for an hour and a half. Yes, just to have just to reserve our spots. Wow, there was a, there was a snow cone truck, so we got some we got oh, some Kona ice. That was up, but uh, yes, that was that was good. Um, Archer has this same truck visit his uh, summer program every two Fridays, so he was like, "All right, I'll, I will tell you what you need to get. I'll tell you what. All right, <laughs> it's so like here, the, pro. Here are the flavors. Oh yeah, he was a, he was a pro. He's like, "All right, what, what what are you in the mood for right now? All right, because I'll I'll tell you so." <laughs> Anyway, her show was great. Everybody was fantastic. Obviously, Shannon was there and some more of our friends were there as well. So I knew a couple other people and she just killed it. She killed her number, just destroyed it, stole the show. Nice. But then intermission came and it started thundering and lightninging. Uh-oh. And so they had to tell everybody to leave. Oh, so, no. Yep. So I only saw the first half. It's free, so we're going to go back again this weekend. Um, going to bring some more snacks, going to bring some more drinks, going to bring some more video games, and we're going to do it all again. Wow. Do it all again. So, yes, more more of that in my future. Now, are you going to go back and watch the whole show, or are you going to be like, oh, I've already seen the first half. I'm just going to go for intermission I, and watch I, the second I, it, half. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to see the full show. I'm going to see the full show. What a supportive. I was all, what a supportive. Husband. Yes, I I am. I am so so supportive. And then another interesting project I've been working on. Uh, I've unfortunately had to go to a couple funerals recently for uh, relatives of some close high school friends. And hmm. as you know, being there, I brought a camcorder around all the time during high school. So this was like ninety nine, two thousand, two thousand one, two thousand two, oh, yeah. right around there. Uh, nobody had cell phones and certainly nobody had cell phones that could do video. So having a random kid walking around the halls with the camcorder was like, 
what is that? Why is that kid doing that? So no one really stopped me. Um, never got in trouble for filming anything. Kid teachers were just kind of confused about it. So I had it on like all the time. So I have a ton, a ton of footage for around, you know, the 99 to 2002 zone. And I have footage of people who are no longer with us. So uh, wow. I wanted to, I finally took all of my tapes out of my attic and said, you know what, let me, let me find a way to get these digitized. I had sent one off years mm. ago and it was like 16 bucks for one tape and i have like 50 brian Oof. wow um and what kind of tape is not, this is this like mini dv or it's i have some mini dv i have some vhs c those wow. ones that that fit into the vhs converter you know mm -hmm. and then oh, i have yeah. mo most of the ones i have 45 different um I have, four, I have 45 tapes of the digital eight slash high eight. High tapes. eight. Yeah. I was going to say, yeah, I worked, so I those, worked at radio shack at the time that we're talking about here and I yeah. sold all these tapes. Yeah. Yeah. So those are the <laughs> ones that I need converted the most. I, I still have about 15, 16 of the VHSC and then probably like another 15 of the mini DV, but mostly they're the high eights and uh, there's no converter for those. Uh, mm. The camcorder that I had no longer works. So the cheapest option was to buy another old camera off eBay and just use that as the deck to kind of okay. transfer that. Cause it was, you know, a digital camera. So you can mm. use a fire wire if you remember those wow. and uh, get those uploaded to the TV. Is this fire wire 400 or 800? I don't know. It was like 18. <laughs> I want to say it was like, I don't remember, <laughs> but I, like now I remember I had to have a FireWire port in the back of my oh, computer. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, so now they make FireWire to USB cables. So mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. that, I don't know. So I'm doing that, but my, my friend actually ordered for me a camcorder because he wants all this stuff too. And so he actually bought the camcorder off eBay, brought it to the, brought wow. it to the house this weekend. It doesn't work. It does the same thing my old one did. It oh, just the eject, the eject thing doesn't work. The playback's wonky. So we're going to have to send that back to eBay. It's just this whole thing. It's just mm. old tech, old tape tech. And it, it, these, the heads just wear down and who knows what's going on. So I'm, I'm, I'm figuring that out. I uh, mm. thought about like sending them in and maybe just sending in the ones that we know are good. But there's so much random crap and we don't want to miss any of the little good nuggets, especially if it the, the does have, you know, some people that are no longer here. I'd like to get some of this footage to their families, even if it's just random crap that's mm. not special. It's still memory. It's still important. So yeah, I'd, I'd like to be able to watch them and actually sort through all this, but it's going to be, it's going to be a project. That is going to be a project. Yeah. That's a tough yeah. thing about any type of digital recording is if you don't keep up with the conversions as you go, then trying to go back like a couple of decades like that is a bit rough. Yeah. I mean, it, it my camera has been broken for a long time. So, mm. um, yeah, we'll, we'll get it figured out eventually, but you know, this is, this is just the beginning. I feel <laughs> Wow, 50 tapes. That's a lot. And you it's more than 50. It's more than 50. And, it, and I mean, you, just, just 50 in that different genre there's probably like more like 75 if you add everything and, together and if you digitize that you would have to like play it in real time and record it as it plays right you're not like yeah there's no digital transfer of that no you have to play you have to hit play on the camcorder or if you have a deck you hit play on that and then you capture it on your editing program on your computer uh oh premiere gosh. used to be able to do it i don't know if it, could, it still can um but uh yeah there's usually a, a digital program on your computer that you click the capture and it just captures whatever's being played. Wow. So, yeah. That would be a project. I know. I know. It's almost, you know, I might end, I might end up sending him, sending him in. Yeah. Good luck with that. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I have no advice for you on that one. Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> what about um, you? What's been going on in the Goulet world? Well, let's see here. We had Rachel's parents visit last weekend, which was a good time. Did the whole family thing, so that was nice. Um, did a little project. I've been, <laughs> I've been working on a project with her dad for like a year, um, making some like a wood handled uh, like cork corkscrew like bottle opener. You know, like something you'd have in your kitchen drawer to like open like, you know, pull a cork out of a wine bottle kind of a thing. That's so a like, corkscrew. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's not like a regular twist one. You like flip it out and it's got the like thing where you can cut the foil and all that kind of stuff. So it's like oh. it's a little more involved to it. Sort of like a pocket knife type of a situation with a corkscrew on it. Anyway, so it's got like, you know, the sides are the sides are off and you can make your own blanks. 
you know, kind of carve your own handles basically for this thing. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you can buy like either like pocket knife kits or corkscrew kits or whatever. Um, so, you know, we do some woodworking stuff and, you know, I bought this thing a while ago and him and I started this project, but then, you know, <laughs> just haven't worked on it all that much. So it's like every time he comes down, it's like, oh, we'll glue this next part on. All right, we got to wait for the glue to set up. And then it's like, oh, okay, well, the visit's over. Well, we'll work on it next time. And it's like, it's just going on and on. Like I could easily finish this thing in like a couple of days, right. but I like want to do it with him, you know? So it's like, oh, okay, well, we'll see you in a month or whatever. And <laughs> we'll work on it some more. So eventually we'll have that one, but uh, I'm not going to hype that up and try to have pictures or anything like that. Cause it's so what, what percentage time. are you uh, completed at this point? So we've glued, we've glued on, like we've got, we've, got the wood, we cut it, we fit it on there. So basically the way these things work is you, you know, it's all, it's all metal components and stuff like that. But then it's like missing the handle part that you, you know, basically epoxy wood onto it. And then once that epoxy cures, you drill and you put these like little brass pins in epoxy those in place. And then you sand the whole thing. So, you know, to get it all smooth and make the wood match up to the metal and stuff like that. And then polish and put finish on it. So we're probably like 80% done with this thing at this point. Okay. So the glue's set up. And so now I just got to like basically sand and polish it, which again, I could do that this afternoon, but no, you then can't. I would be doing it Not without allowed. him. You know what I mean? So um, anyway, so fun little, those are fun little projects. Um, so uh, we worked on that and then uh, did a lot of electrical work around the house. So I talked a while ago in the pencast, I don't remember how long ago it was, about how Rachel and I had bought a bunch of light fixtures to replace some old ones that we had. Um, and I did some of them, but I didn't do all of them. It was like seven light fixtures or something for like our hallway and our closets and all that. Well, I did the hallway ones and I just haven't had, I haven't done the closet ones. I think I've had these lights for two and a half years at this point. So <laughs> it was time. Uh, so her oh. dad helped me with that a little bit, you know, really I just, there's, there's no reason I couldn't have done it on my own. I just busy guy. And, uh, it's, we already had working lights in our closets. We were just updating the fixtures. So it was, my motivation was limited. Um, yeah. But, I've been there. I've had yeah. light fixtures hanging out and yeah, I, I hate them yeah. a lot. And I, I pulled them out and I've got like one compact fluorescent and another, you know, I don't even have matching light bulbs in there. And no. so I was like, oh, okay. Do you, is it, do, do you, does, does, do the larger fixtures make your arms feel really weak? Because no matter how light they are, I feel like every light fixture breaks me because I'm like, just at some point, just trying desperately to hold it on while I'm doing other stuff. I'm like, why can't I just hold this thing up? Right. It oh yeah. Makes Especially me feel by, like we did three fixtures in a row. It, so I like know, by the third fixture, so, you're just like, oh, no. <laughs> right it's it just it's so discouraging like, yeah. so like I, this is not a heavy thing and it's a, not but yeah we have, we have a lot of ladybugs that get into our house and no, sorry asian lady beetles so I've right 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 and those lights are just asian lady beetle collectors so oh yes we had like a 50 of them in like our oh, g- God. our guest room closet you know it's just like gross so Do you ever have yeah, those oh sorry go fun. ahead no, that was all. I'm talking just talking about. Bug Do you collectors. have those those fixtures that just have like such a crap ton of insulation in them, and oh, yeah. you need to like the 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 post like the screw the the the, the um the the, not the the screw post or the bolt post or whatever you have to fill fit in through the tiny little holes in the oh, insulation yeah. that you can't even see. Oh, yeah. So you're like trying to oh my god. Yeah. They're so simple to do. They're not hard. That's not why hard. I hate them so much. Like the actual installation is not hard, but these little random things like having mm-hmm. to hold something up for way too long or find those stupid little holes, poke through the installation. God. <sighs> there. Yeah. I'm okay. Yeah. I, 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 I feel for you. I'm, I'm empathizing. I'm. Yep. That's why I put it off for this long, but finally <laughs> yes. did them, got them out of the way. I think that was, that was the last like lingering home project that Rachel asked me to do. I have a lot of other things that I need to do. And stuff that I see, but that was the only thing that she's like, she gives me a lot of grace with home projects. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that felt really good getting that one done. And then, um, did a couple other electrical things. I had, I installed a floodlight on one of my sheds cause it's always dark over there. So I did that. I, um, we have like, um, overhead lights in our kitchen that I had replaced with LEDs. It used to be halogen, like really, those really hot, like small things. And I replaced them with LEDs but whatever like dimmer like thing was in there, I guess was like slightly older. wasn't like super made for these LEDs. 
So like if you turned them up all the way, they would like pulsate, like the light would pulsate a little bit and would just like kind of trick your eyes out. So we could never turn it up all the way. And then when I turned it off, there was one bulb out of the six that were there that would like just have a little bit of light left in it. And I was like, it's off. Why is there, why is there a bulb that still has a little bit of light? So I was like, okay, I, I asked my electrician, he didn't know. And I finally was just like, all right, it's probably the, it's probably the dimmer switch. Like it's just not, it's not oh, made yeah. for, you know, cause LED, you know, when you go from halogen to LED, that's a quite a bit of difference of like resistance and light consumption and stuff. And I think the dimmer just wasn't like tuned to go low enough and handle like the range of LED. So I replaced it and now it works great. So replace the dimmer, replace the dimmer switch. Yeah. Ah. It was frustrating because the other dimmer switch, I mean, I would say it worked fine, but it didn't because of the bulbs I put in, but it was still functional. It was actually the same brand and style, literally the same thing, but there's different electronics in there or something. <coughs> so now I did it and it's, it's great. So, do you have yeah. one of those poles that change the halogen light bulbs, like one of the extendable poly things? You know, because you mentioned something about that the other day. No, Did I? I, I okay. Don't, I don't have one of those. No. Oh, okay. I I didn't know. I've been I've been asking a bunch of people. No. <laughs> I don't live in a mansion, so I don't have chandeliers that are out of my reach. Like uh, it's not do. for shit. It's one of the outside lights. It's the floodlight. <laughs> I have an outside, I have a flood, outside floodlight above my garage door, which I can reach with a step stool. And then the other one that I have is right outside uh, one of our bedroom windows. And I can, I can like reach outside the window and change the bulbs. So I don't have to actually uh, hmm. get on a ladder to change those ones. So I kind of lucked out just with the placement of those. I might try that. It's not, the the one that's, Pointing mm. away from the window is the one I need to change. Why, you have no faith in me, do you? I see you what you're doing. Uh, what kind of face is that? I'm just, I'm just saying, you know, keep your feet firmly planted. Oh, wow, ground. you were just saying you did. Oh, wow, okay. The faithlessness is just, <laughs> man. Mm -mm -mm. All right, Brian. I remember that. I'm just saying, Drew, you know, we would all miss I you if something that. happened to you. I don't want to hear about You know, some... you know, you know this is this is a company that does 360 valuations, right? I get to I get to talk about my manager and how he doesn't believe in me. Well, we'll find out. If you can change this thing successfully and, <laughs> and keep your keep your body firmly planted on hard surfaces, then then we'll be fine. You'll be just okay. you'll be justified in your criticism, but <laughs> Oh my gosh. Um also, you know, I've uh, I've been chipping up a bunch of wood. You know me, I'm always working in the woods. And uh, I'm trying to basically break down all my wood chips into, you know, sort of a compost pile. So let it kind of degrade. And I'm throwing like my food and basically making a, a big compost pile. Well, essentially what I've created is a giant like food source for a bunch of blackbirds and other animals and stuff like that. So like... Uh. And I'm like walking all the way out to the corner of my yard and I'm trying to dump all this stuff and I'm like mixing it, you know, constantly and all that. Doesn't matter. All these animals, they just go and burrow it out and dig out whatever food I put in there. And I'm like, why am I doing all this? Huh. I just have a big pile of wood chips now that is just a place that now all the animals know to go to get whatever food that I've put in oh, there. And I'm like, well, this yeah. is this is pointless. So I'm, I think I'm gonna stop doing that because I'm just wasting my time. And it was like, not, when it's like 99 degrees out, feels like 105. And I'm like walking out there to sweaty and stuff on my lunch break to go bring food out to feed the blackbirds that are then just gonna <laughs> fight over it on my roof. And like, they woke Rachel up the other day because they were like, what the heck is going on up there? And I looked out there and it was just a bunch of blackbirds just being punks, you know, <laughs> fighting, over, fighting over some piece of garbage I threw out there. And I was like, being punks blackbirds man they're just they're yeah they're they're big too they're pretty big i don't know whether we have, they're we have, i don't know if they're blackbirds or cravens or rose or, or crows or whatever <laughs> i don't know what they are i don't know what they are but they're big cravens and or rose there's like a whole there's a whole like gang of them out there it's like probably a dozen or so that all they're like punks to, that's all that matters yeah they're like they're like teenagers they're just out there they're like loitering <laughs> <laughs> you know, just trying to get free with their food. their skateboards. They're just causing a bunch of chaos, fighting with each other. You know, you go out there and you're kind of like, hey, get out of here. And they all kind of scatter and, you know, <laughs> feel like. <laughs> you're like the convenience store owner. I'm like a owner, convenience store just... owner that's like trying to get rid of the teenagers loitering outside yep. my place. Yeah, that's what I feel like. You got your Mountain Dew now. Get out of here. Get out of here. If you're not going to buy something, get out of here. <laughs> um, anyway, um, and <laughs> I continue with my outdoor adventures, so. 
you know, I planted all those like flowers and stuff for Rachel. That was her Mother's Day gift. Yeah, yeah. Like most most of them have died. I've been trying ah. to save them. I've been watering. I've really been trying to do well, but like like half of the half of the lilies that I planted for her, the voles have like you know done like the movie Tremors, and they've just like eaten the roots and like sucked them down into the ground. Oh. <laughs> so like half of them are like com- literally completely gone. The other half, the flowers fell off, and it's been like months now, and they haven't grown back, and they're just like slowly dying. And yeah, I don't know. Everything that we planted in like planters, like in pots or planter boxes, are doing okay. So I don't know if it's a soil thing. I don't know if there's like bugs or some other thing that's going at them. But we planted like hydrangeas, and all the flowers have died, and they look all just terrible. And I'm like watering them. Like I never know whether I'm overwatering or underwatering. But whatever it is, I'm doing it wrong. And everything is dying. And this is what happens yeah. to me and Rachel with almost everything we plant. So it's tough. It's been t- it's been especially yeah. tough this season. Last season, all my stuff did much, much better. The heat really? and we also had a much longer um like winter. Like normally our yeah. our last our last frost is supposed to be like April 14th or 17th over here. Yeah. And we had we had some really close frost points up like two weeks after spring. We did had already started. So we got a late start and then the heat just slammed us. So Yeah, that's true. That's true. The nature has not been happy with the environment right now. So yeah. it's been it's been rough and um no, I, I totally understand. I my flowers have not been doing well either. I planted a bunch of mm. pollinator pollinator plants this year for the mm-hmm. butterflies and the bees and all of them are they're struggling hardcore. They none of them look pretty, but they're really not supposed to. They're supposed to be pollinator plants yeah but uh yeah they're not doing well the veggies are doing okay but okay. Uh, the, poll- okay. the pollinator flowers are not all right well at least it's not just me no not just you all right good to know um and then last thing i have is a personal update um so joseph has uh by rachel's recommendation actually but do no interaction of my own has uh gotten some cargo shorts and he is freaking loving them He's I think you mentioned this last time. Him. Yeah, but he actually got him in. And he's oh, wearing, he got him in. Yes. Yep, and oh, he's good. wearing them and he is loving life. He is a cargo short man. So nice. I don't know. I didn't, I, you know, I didn't push it. I didn't like, you know, whatever. It's, it's his own choice. And it's uh, in his DNA. He's, uh, he's super pragmatic. He's like, I keep my pencil over here, my pencil sharpener in this pocket. And all, he's got it like all planned out. He's got his cargo mapped out in his shorts. And I was like, this kid, he's going to, yep, this is going to be a thing. He's going to have a uniform. Excellent. He's had the same haircut since he, since birth, basically. Like he, <laughs> does, he does not want to change his haircut. He just likes things the way he likes them. Can't fault him for that. No, not at all. Yep. So there we go. Um, don't have any company updates, but we'll go ahead and wrap this thing up for this episode. All right. Well, thanks for hanging in with us for another two hour episode here. I want to thank y'all for watching. Leave us some feedback, please, in the comments. Let us know how we're doing. Ask us random questions. Love getting y'all's feedback. Um, if you want to learn about some more fountain pen stuff or shop or check out some cool pictures and whatnot, you can go to gulepens.com. That is our company. And you can check out what we're doing there. And you can subscribe to YouTube, Instagram, all those fun things because we're posting stuff all the time. Uh, if you want to email us, you can send an email to pencast at gulepens.com, especially if you like to listen to the audio thing. And Drew, I promised a mind-blowing random fun fact, and I created my own today. So I hope my math is right, and I hope it goes better than the hypothetical that I tried to do. But I was like, I want to do a fun fact about paper. So I did. So I was like, I wonder how much paper we use like as a society every year. So I did a little research and according to statista.com, globally, we use over 400 million metric tons of paper. First off, I was like, what is a metric ton? How is that different than a regular? Because, you know, we're in the U.S. and a ton is 2,000 pounds in the U.S. A metric ton is a thousand kilograms. So it's slightly different. It's like 2,200 pounds or so. So so anyway, I was just curious, what is a metric ton? But it's very heavy. It's a lot of paper. Um, Now this does include paper products and like uh, cardboard and stuff too. So it's not just like writing paper, but whatever, paper products. Um, 400 million metric tons, that's a lot. Um, Weight wise, that is equivalent to a thousand Empire State Buildings. Ah, that's how much paper every year we use. Um, oh. and then I was curious. I was like, 
well, there's some math here. It's like, I wonder if you had 80 gram paper, like one single sheet of 80 gram paper that was 400 million metric tons. How big would that piece of paper be? So I did a little math. So 80 grams per square meter, you know, that's what the ADG, like a rhodia thickness, right? So if you made a rhodia thickness piece of paper that represented all the paper that the world uses every year, um, uh, I did the math. So a metric ton of paper at 80 grams per square meter would cover 12,500 square meters, which is a lot. I didn't translate that into anything. But anyway, you take that number, because that's one ton, you take 400 million tons, which is what we do every year. Um, that's like equivalent to 5 trillion square meters of coverage. Um, and then I did the math on that. And uh, so the amount of paper that's produced each year is enough to cover about half of the United States or half of China, they're pretty close in size. So yeah, with that 80 gram thickness. So that's how much paper we use as a society every year, half a United but, States worth. But could you fold it more than seven times if it was that big? Hmm, another mm. fun fact, if you folded a sheet of paper 42 times, it would reach the moon. How about All that? the facts. How about that? So All no, facts. I don't think you could fold it seven times. It actually doesn't matter the size of the paper. Do you think you that there are, do you think we're using more or less paper than we did, uh, you know, uh, 40 years ago? Uh, more, we're using a lot more. more, a lot more. Yeah, because we're, we're shipping a lot more things, yeah. um, but we're writing on paper less. Um, well, <laughs> so like offices, offices, no offices I are. I won't get into that, but no, actually there's still quite a bit of paper that's used in office settings. Part of that is but, because of there's a whole paper lobby and all this kind of stuff. I'm not going to get all into that, but big paper. There is a the whole big paper thing. <gasps> Again, I started read. I, I started finding some big sources paper. around that in researching all this, and I was like, Dunder and Mifflin. No but then doubt. I was reading a lot of conflicting numbers, and I started there was obvious agendas to different sources I was reading, and I was like, okay, oh, I'm not going down man. this rabbit hole. Oh no. But that's not the fountain pen paper maker. This Dark is a paper. Whole different, yeah, there's a, there, I'm sure there's a big paper out there. We're not going to get all into that. Oh, oh my gosh. But anyway, it's a lot of paper. We use a lot of paper in this, in this world. Oh. All right. It's better than plastic. Yeah. Yeah. I guess. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. It's more maybe, renewable than plastic. More yeah. recyclable, more renewable than plastic. I don't know. We're out of our depth, and we are in the turkey hammock. Deep Very much. Hammock. So, uh, yeah, thanks so much for watching, everybody. We will uh, stay cool out there if you are in the northern hemisphere and in the heat like all of us. But, um, yeah, hope you enjoyed this one. Thanks so much for watching, and right on.